I think I saw you. There was a Reconstructionist radio thing. This would have been like 2017 or 2018 in Central Texas somewhere. Oh, did you go to that? Yeah, I'm not sure how many years ago that. It was at least three years ago, probably between yeah. three and five yeah, years about ago. Two or three years. It was um, when Steve was still there. And it was in his house. Is that his name? He was a truck driver. I Yes, I remember that now. Yep. That was at his house. Was that the only time that y'all met there? It wasn't. That was the only time I've ever met anybody anywhere. Okay. Okay. So that was really special. That wasn't something that y'all do like every six months or a year. Uh, I think they do it. I, I, ever since, uh, and I can't remember the, the guy's name. He's a truck driver now. And he's the one who sort of pulled it all to, all of that together. Okay. Um, and it was in his house and you know, a bunch of people from all over showed up. I remember that. I think you were speaking and that I got there while you were in the middle of speaking, but I really appreciated the atmosphere. It's like kids are swimming. People are talking. You listen to the sermon if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> Very much. It put my theory to the test. <laughs> oh, was that your, they did that based on your suggestion? Oh no, no. It's just, I've always said that, that, um, if you look at the life of Christ, um, Almost nothing in the Gospels would have ever been written if he followed the rules of, of standard church procedure of everybody sit in your proper place and keep your mouth shut and look like you're interested. Mm -hmm. Almost everything interesting thing that happened to him uh, came as a, as, as a result of an interruption of some sort. Yeah, it's over the dinner table or it's walking walking into town or going to the next city over. Right. There's lots of opportunities for for question and answer time and yeah and even the church that I'm at now it's like you, you still sit through a sermon for 30 to 30 to 50 minutes and then if you want you can get in a line of 20 other people to ask two very brief questions at the most if you jump into line fast enough before everybody <laughs> it's time for everybody to go home you're in uh, North, North Carolina, Carolina Asheville Biggest town in the area, and even so, nobody really knows where it is. <laughs> right. How did you get involved but, with um, the Reconstructionist Radio? Because you, your podcast went, ran for like two, three years? Probably got in because I was a friend of um, Bojadar's, uh, Marinoff's. Everything was going along great, and then all of a sudden, everybody decided that um, we just couldn't get along anymore. Largely, um, the patriarchal slash racist connection that that was a sticking point for people particularly for people like Bojadar and um uh Joel McDermott kinism kin, yeah kinism and patriarchy uh kind of going together hand in hand i mean i don't know how to say it it wasn't my issue but if i'm going to take sides i would be on their side of the question I don't know if that makes sense. I mean, it probably just offends all groups. Conservatism, and particularly theonomic and reformed conservatives, I can't speak for other groups much, have, have always had Kenneths, for lack of a better word, that have more or less fit in with that group. And it's always been undefined. And it's, it's always been a relatively small and battled group. And so consequently, uh, it's sort of like, you know, if somebody wants to be on your side, why not? They've always been there. And anyway, people like Joel McDermott and, Bo and Bush are decided to draw a line. But that's not really my expertise. It's, it's, it's not even my, it's not a fight I would have picked because I'm, I'm just used to ignoring them. It's like you're stuck <laughs> with them. It's a small camp anyway. Basically, almost every conversation I have with anybody, one way or the other, comes comes around to some biblical issue that I share with them. My wife caters banquets and things and uh, wedding parties. I uh, run a coffee shop. This is called Moments. It's in Swannanoa. If, if that's, it's, it's an unincorporated part of Buncombe County in between Black Mountain and Asheville. It's sort of about as far out on the cutting edge of liberalism as you can be. There's a trail going through it that uh, it's known if you go through there, you'll probably pass a whole bunch of people uh, nude sunbathing on the rocks in the river, for instance. It's a lot of people my age. And it's not a nudist colony either. It's just, it's, it's a group of people that I've had a burden to minister to really ever since Operation Rescue, if people who are old enough to have been involved in that 
the people who are the clinic defenders all would have come straight out of this college. I mean, most of Asheville would have been clinic defending. Because what I believe is a gospel worldview, literally anything that we're talking about at any time and at any place, teaching is way too formal a word. When we're going over how to be a good barista, how to make a good latte, it will, and, and I can't even tell you what it would be now, but if we were doing it, just in discussing the latte, I would be sharing a biblical principle. I would know they're a Christian and say, now, I know you feel like God has a plan for your life and, and you became a Christian because you want to find out what God wants you to do and all of that. But I can tell you, uh, if you can't establish the kingdom of God in the bottom of this toilet bowl over here, then don't think you're going to go out there and establish the kingdom of God anywhere. Everybody here is going to know that you're a Christian. You can't hide it. They know I'm a Christian. You also know that, that everybody around here really doesn't like Christians. They have a visceral reaction to Christians, much the same way we would have a visceral reaction to a child molester. The presentation of the gospel is in a form that they have been geared to react negatively to it. And so what I do is just present the gospel in a thousand ways that nobody's ever thought of before, but I only think of it as, as I'm going along. Uh, for instance, everybody coming into the coffee shop needs something. And this is basically what Jesus was talking about. When he told his followers they have to take up their cross. Because what we're doing is we are sacrificing our time and efforts to give them what they came in here for. Coffee, latte, smoothies, something like that. And what we're doing is, is we're taking up our cross for them. I, I know you're not a Christian. And so you don't think of yourself as taking up a cross. And I get that. I also know you respect Jesus. And this is what he told his followers to do. Fact is, probably the reason you don't like Christians is because you don't see them taking care of people. And they're like, yeah, absolutely. Christians are hypocrites. I mean, you know, we all know that. <laughs> and I said, you're right. You're right. One day when I was just really pissed off at Christians and thought it was all a hoax, I just said, you know, I'd still rather be in heaven with some of the hypocrites than in hell with all of them. And, and they'll laugh at that. This is just basic Christian discipleship. Jesus said, make disciples of all nations. That's what I'm doing with you right now. You're not a Christian yet, but you may find that God works on your heart. If he doesn't, hey, I'm your friend. I'm here. We got work to do together. That would be the sort of flow of things. Christians today are, are convinced that these are the last days. And I always agree with them because they'll be dead in about 20 or 30 years. And so these really are your last days. How are you going to live in them? Listening to some of your different episodes and a common theme throughout some of the articles, uh, they're Facebook posts, but they're essentially articles, like they're basically newspaper columns yes. because they're long enough. But yeah, one of the common themes in your posts and podcasts is just the, there's nothing wrong with tradition, but the traditional form that the church has taken, it seems like a very inefficient use of time for one person to address a room of a hundred to 5,000 for an hour on a topic that may or may not be helpful to anybody at any given time, very little opportunity for feedback. And that's sort of expected, like, if you're not doing that and you're not finding that valuable, then you're not a healthy believer. And it's right. gotten to the point where I'm like, I don't find it valuable because I have heard these things talked about so much. What do I need to go out there and be doing in ministry? bringing new people in or something that's not just me sitting and listening. I agree with that. When the first administrative task of the church arose, uh, it was to take care of the widows, of a caring for the poor and caring for the needy kind of a ministry. My guess is if you just came to a church service, any given gathering of the people, you probably could have gotten a meal. But, but this goes beyond that. The apostles very quickly realized that, that, you can spend a lot of time doing this. And so that's where Peter says, we're to devote ourselves to the ministry of the word and prayer. So, so how do you do that? Well, in a world of very few manuscripts and a relatively limited number of people who could read the, the manuscripts, and then beyond that, a relatively limited number of people of the philosophical temperament and so forth, that they would want to teach those manuscripts and so forth. Um, how does the ministry of the word take place? Normally, the pastoral, your, 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 your ordained minister is considered the minister of the word. So, so how is it going to function? Well, the guy who reads them is usually going to be the guy who keeps them. So he's going to read them the most. So he's going to be the answer man. 
and everybody else goes about, but but you get together to hear them read and, and that sort of thing. So the whole structure of the gathering of the people, the ecclesia, is is going to be formed around the scarcity of text and the um, uh, really the expertise of the of 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 the literate, relatively philosophical person. He's going to become a what? Well, the culture calls that guy a priest. Okay, so the, that works for the church. We'll call him a priest. And and by the time you get to the ecumenical councils, about three hundred years later, a pretty firm pattern has set up here, and it's all organized around the technology, the IT of the early church, or the the IT of the world at that time, which is handwritten manuscripts and not many of those. Um, well, you you come to the Reformation, and and before the Reformation, not Tyndale, but but a Wycliffe. Um, spends his life, he's one of the brightest scholars in, in England, and he spends his life writing article after article and book after book, fighting the church. One of his great quotes is, we ought to just burn the Vatican down and put the beggars out to beg, and it would do them good, uh, instead of stealing from the people. I mean, he, he was a pretty radical guy. I mean, he, uh, they dug up his bones a hundred years later and burned them. They just couldn't get at him until then. Well, anyway, um, uh, when the Reformation comes, there's also been a huge step in IT, information technology, and it's the printing press. And the Christians were right there with a vision of what to do with this technology, with this technology of the word. And within about 200 years, they had literally discipled all of Europe to be largely literate and to be what we would call today citizens and churchmen. Uh, to be people who could vote for things in church and vote for things in society. Uh, they were they had grown up enough to make choices. And so you, your ministry of the word grew to every church had scripture. And then after a while, every person could have a Bible. Uh, well, you now have the Bible everywhere. So, so what is the ministry of the word? Well, it's still gathering to hear the expert because he has all the tools and all that sort of thing and the education. Well, today, what has happened? We have had an IT explosion um, is, is Gutenberg on steroids. Every person walks into church with, with the full complement of, of three walls full, well, three shelves full of textual apparatus that any pastor who's a scholarly pastor can use to really get into exegesis. And everybody's got it. They're sitting with it there. And my question is, why? Well, one reason is they're not that interested in that kind of technical stuff. But another thing is, we're still using first century technology, first century IT, not even Gutenberg IT, first century IT, to, to structure our, our organization. It doesn't make sense to do with that anymore. Why not? Why couldn't the people in the church who think they have the gift of teaching do podcasts? Why couldn't the church get together? And, and eat together and discuss what they saw, we could then really begin to have, in a sense, Ephesians 4 um, uh, structured churches in which those who have the teaching, prophetic, whatever gifts to, to be able to really say things right can have that impact in building each person up so that in whatever, not each person being built up so that they can be the pastor of a church, but each person being built up so they can prophetically apply the word of God to the piece of creation that God has, has put them in charge of. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and rule over it is not a command to go out and be a king and raise an army and run a territory because very few of us, I mean, let's just say that's what God wanted to do. Well, then a small handful of people get to fulfill his commission. You know, those are the guys who run everybody else's life. Is there a way that commission can be fulfilled by everybody in such a way that we're no longer dependent to have some authority in our life to force us in the right direction, but rather from the heart we're transformed? Aside from everything else, that's kind of the my mental journey to that position. And then when I looked at every verse describing salvation after that, it's like that's exactly what salvation is. The transformation of each individual person so that they can be ministers of the word of God to the piece of creation, which in my case happens to be a coffee shop, and a whole bunch of that creation happens to be dishwashing, 
uh, happens to be delivering food and things like that. That's that's the part of creation, which which I try to in every way bring under the authority of the Word of God, be an expert in it, and to disciple the people, the nations. I don't care if they're Christians or not. If they're working for me, they're going to get discipled, mm. and and uh, that's how they're going to hear the gospel. Yeah, it really feels like the church is behind in terms of thinking of what stage of the new covenant we're in, in terms of how much actual time we have left. I'm convinced that we have a long time. The one parable that Jesus told about how long it was going to take for the bridegroom to come, the parable of the 10 virgins, he says, half of the people who are not prepared for a long wait, half of the virgins, five of them, were not prepared for a long wait, and they weren't allowed into the wedding feast. I think that we're really in, in that sense, kind of early stages. We're just 2,000 years later realizing that God's law is actually an important template for structuring society. When I was in jail to do Bible studies with my fellow inmates who were all churched but knew almost nothing about Scripture, but knew a lot of strange things, um, I always started them in Genesis and built out from there. Because when you were in jail or doing jail ministry? No, in jail, in okay. jail with Operation Rescue. I only had three, four more month stents before I was in jail. And, and those are the times to really build uh, Bible studies and, and, and a ministry outreach. And I didn't have the vision then, but now I'm thinking, why couldn't you, why couldn't you start a church there? Anyway, but the point is, I would start with people who really, um, and, and I would have to agree, most people think of it's kind of the bottom of the barrel. And, and there really is no question about that. Many of them were. And and building them from Genesis to uh, to Revelation, a concept of what Scripture is, a concept of who God is and what their place is, and uh, what self-control is. And, and, and out of all that, I realized in looking back on it, my whole life has been geared towards even when I go back to where I was the Presbyterian of the Presbyterians, you want to understand how to run a church? Go look at the Book of Church Order. It's the best thing ever written. It's so good. They designed the Constitution of the United States after it. That was more or less my position. And I think it's a strong position. I think that, that the world made a huge step forward in those areas. Um, what, what really started turning my thinking, though, was... The question, is that all? Jesus spent 2,000 years to get us to the point so we could have representative government, so that the average person could be old enough to, excuse me, not old enough, but, but mature enough, together enough, self-controlled enough to be a responsible voter. Is that it? And, and here we are, and, and we can't think of any other way. So, so the purpose of the church is uh, one of the key things, if you ask anybody who's a Protestant, you know, you have your elders and they're to discipline. I don't know when you were growing up. Hear those old um, uh, Oklahoma? Um, yeah, the musical? I, the operettas, the musicals, right. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the songs that always sticks in my mind is everything's up to date in Kansas City. They've gone about as far as they can go. You can turn the radiator on whenever you want some heat. Every house is completely furnished. Every house is all complete. Now, there's not a person listening to this podcast who would be comfortable in one of the houses that, that, that back then in, in, in 1900 that they were describing. Um, none of us would be. It, it's another person once said to me, um, uh, you know, we were talking about something completely different. He said, you know, uh, an ounce of gold would buy a fine suit in 1895 and it buys a fine suit today. And I'm thinking, you mean a, a $5,000 fine suit, a, a off the rack JC Penney's? I mean, what's a fine suit? I don't know. But aside from all that, I asked him, can you think of any other artifact from 1895 that we still use today? Um, my wife said wooden spoons in the kitchen. Those are pretty good. I, I like those. <laughs> yeah. I'm saying seriously, the houses are different. Uh, the heating systems are different. Our communication systems are different. How we treat each other is different. Are different, you know, the people who defend patriarchy, that they would be considered egalitarian 100 years ago, that that's how far they have shifted in an egalitarian direction. And, and I know the egalitarians have no patience for patriarchy people, because they don't get how much the world has just changed. I mean, it's just, 
everything has shifted over like that. But somehow we believe that, that the best thing to do is go back to the good old days. And, and that's, that's one of the ways Christians, by the way, this is going to be a radical shift, fall into that total trap. When white Christians look back on the 50s as being the good old days, I got to say, if you're an upper middle class white Christian, those are pretty good days. Anybody else who's black looks back on those days as Christianity was defined as I could have something that's a good old day, and it doesn't matter what my black Christian brother or sister is living like or how I treat them, or I may be a good person. Uh, I came from a very racially open-minded family, but there was a family that tolerated what was going on because that's just the way it was. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I'm not going to look back and we, we just fall into that trap um, of, of, of thinking that because times are good for us, uh, therefore somehow this must be God saying, soul, take thy knees. We've mm -hmm. gone about as far as we can or, go. Or there's nobody else out there who's not having their, their good old days right now that needs help. Yeah, absolutely. My dad um, told me when he was growing up, he went to go, they were at the grocery store and he went to go drink out of a water fountain. And his mom said, no, 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 not that one. Use the other one. And he had no idea why, but he switched over. And then I think it didn't dawn on him for a while. But that one, the one he was drinking out of said colored. Right. And the other one said white. They grew up in a very racially tolerant, tolerant family too, but still there was enough of a stigma. I mean, her mom, his mom could have pushed the limits by saying, yeah, you can drink out of the colored water fountain. Who cares? But even still, they knew it was wrong, but was still holding to the stigma. They'd go with the flow. To think that we've gone as far as we can go, either technologically or spiritually, or when Jesus told a parable uh, about the uh, the prosperous farmer who said, uh, soul, take thine ease. I, I mean, yes, it has a thousand different spiritual applications to us thinking spiritually is nothing more we need to do, but it, it actually applies to the entire mindset of thinking that somehow God is satisfied with where we are. And it doesn't matter if we're where we are technologically, where we are anywhere. His command was to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and to to rule over it. And, and so we should never be satisfied. <laughs> that is interesting. We should always be satisfied, but we should never take a soul, take thy, thy knees at attitude. We should always be raising our Ebenezer thus far as the Lord brought me and, and be grateful for where we've come, but always be looking at thus far. And we've still got a long way to go. I often go back to, um, the issue at, at Babel, where they're all talking the same language, so they can accomplish anything. In Jesus' high priestly prayer, as near as I can tell, it's the only place where he, he made an apologetic point, meaning proving the truth of the, of the gospel or the scriptures or of God or of, or of our position. And that is that they may be one, I and them, and you and me, that the world may know. I'm getting older now. There was a time where I could just quickly Google back to my, my memory and, and, and pop out other places. I have been unable to find anywhere uh, in thinking about it, meditating and reading, where, where, where we're told this is how the world knows, by our oneness, by our unity with each other. And, and it's not a top-down unity that he's talking about, unless he's the one at the top. It's we love each other. We care for each other. You can't be a disciple. You can't disciple people if you don't take up a cross for them. There's an interesting way that you mentioned the Tower of Babel. God's making his own version of the Tower of Babel to make us all one, to make us all great. And yes. versus Babel, they were trying to build up as high as they could. But Christ realized that you had to go as far down as you could to really draw That's people Ephesians together. 4. Yeah. Right. When he descended, he went down and he brought gifts to men. And the whole point of the gifts is they, they mature each person to the point, to, to, to use an analogy, we don't let teenagers get married. Excuse me. Uh, we don't let uh, uh, middle schoolers get married. Why? They're not mature. What are mature people able to do? Well, if you've been married any length of time, maturity in a marriage, in my opinion, is, is one very simple thing. It's if I go in this direction any further, 
we're going to come up with an irreconcilable problem. And it's the wisdom just to stop and be able to, to live together without having to make each point you win or I win. And that's maturity. Kids don't have it. You know, kids don't get it. And uh, I, I don't know. Maybe. Everything has to be a binary. I win. I win. You lose rather than it being a cooperative thing where it's like one flesh. All right. Well, if we're going 180 degrees, we're going to opposite each other. We're going to break. Versus if we're going 90, it's like, okay, well, it's this general direction. So I'll, we both right. just go 45 degrees and you're still headed, both headed in the same general direction. And now they're the same. And, and that's fundamentally why I feel like patriarchy fundamentally misses the point. And that is, and I'm talking about a way of living together. Um, the, the fall, the curse, what's the first thing that happened? They go from a one flesh relationship to I'm in charge of you relationship. Uh, and, and, uh, to, and then after 4,000 years of living under the curse, Jesus comes along and he takes away the unilateral disciplinary power that the man had that Moses reinforced. And that was the power of divorce. Mm-hmm. And so when they say, we want to talk about, can we get divorced for this reason, but not that reason? Jesus goes straight to the man's not the one who gets, he doesn't have the unilateral power. In the garden, they were one flesh. Uh, it, it wasn't one person controlling the other. And so the, the disciples, it's not like they want, wanted to go home and kick their wives out, but they're like, man, if I can't control my wife, but she has to know that she pushes this far enough, she's on the street. You know, and, you know, smart, smart girls figure it out and they go, eh, I'd rather live with this chump than be thrown out on the street. Besides, I got kids and he'll get the, you know, it, it kind of goes like that. And, and and Jesus is saying, that's not God's pattern for marriage. Mm-hmm. I've noticed so that. People say, well, Sorry, yeah, go on. Well, I, I've noticed that because uh, in making it to where a husband could just write a certificate of divorce and divorce his wife and remarry and not be any worse for wear not have any kind of penalty with that um that was that was allowed but Mos, uh, yeah. jesus said it was because you're hard-hearted that's why it's allowed from the beginning it's been and christ is sort of bringing it back to it now it's like all right you guys are are mature enough for an hour should be i'm going to tighten this back to its original mm-hmm. strength which was if a man divorces his wife and marries another now he's an adulterer and right. that's such a fascinating picture. It's a, it's an imprecatory commandment against Israel because they're like, well, I can just divorce my wife because God said I can. Well, well, then guess what God does to Israel or the Jews at that time? He's like, oh, okay, I'm just going to divorce you guys. I'm going to kick you out because you haven't been doing what I want. I'm going to get a new wife. So it's like it completely backfires on them and hits them exactly what they dished yes. out. And, and yeah. That, that, that's I hadn't thought of that. That's good. Um, you know the the cross, which I've kind of thrown in there from time to time. I used to think of the cross as identified solely with the atonement, which is no small deal. I'm, I'm, I mean, that's that's pretty important. But Jesus, long before anybody had any idea that that's what, well, long a year or two before anybody realized that that's where it was going, um, said, if anyone would be my disciple, let him take up his cross and follow me. And, and that was the issue of the argument with Peter. Um, you know, Peter's the foundation stone when he confesses Christ, the son of, you, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and Jesus says, good, good work. Uh, and he says, now I'm going to be getting crucified. And he says, no, no, you, you can't talk about that. And so with that confession, Peter becomes a stumbling stone. Hey, and Jesus and says, Christ, get behind me, Satan. Yes, he becomes Satan. I mean, talk about a direct, talk about a reversal of fortunes. <laughs> he went from, it's like holding Bitcoin. I'm rich. Oh, I'm poor. <laughs> <laughs> it's like complete reversal. Um, and so he, um, uh, then just Jesus throws in this gratuitous thing. He says, and by the way, if you don't take up your cross, Peter, you're not a disciple. And it's like he goes from making the cross fundamental. Excuse me, I'm, I'm jumping back and forth in time. 
we go from from realizing I can't be saved unless Jesus takes my place to realizing I can't be a disciple unless I'm a cross bearer like he is Mm -hmm. and go and try to take other people's place. And right. And, and that's when I started realizing Jesus just described economics. Economics is where you sacrifice so that somebody else can, you become an expert. Go back to Genesis 127. You become an expert in some aspect of dominion that I can now meet your needs with. And as I meet your, it, it really doesn't matter if we're talking about coffee or cars or space travel or shovels in the garden it, it, or flush toilets. I always like to tell, that's, that's a, one of the things I'll tell my workers. I said, I'm, I'm, I know you don't realize this, but the law of Moses has been fulfilled right here in this building. Uh, every time you flush the toilet, you're obeying the law of God. Um, so please uh, flush it after every use. Because there in this hole, we can't flush and waste water. So that's, that's, that's one of the ways that I introduce, please flush the toilet, don't leave it yellow, um, is, is by talking about the law of Moses. And, and always remind them, it's incredibly practical. Anyway, getting back to what I was talking about before, forget the flush toilets. It's absolutely everywhere. And, and what you, you do is you sacrifice yourself so that somebody else can fulfill their need. When that happens... And, and it's very mundane. We do it all the time without thinking of it. Um, we stop at stop signs, things like that, uh, instead of just saying, get out of my way, I'm coming through. Uh, and it's just all over in our life. And that's what the economy is. And when we do that, unbelievable wealth and prosperity results. And, and when you get people out away from that process, so so they're not controlling it, so they're not profiteering off of it, um, it ends up cr- bringing more wealth to more average everyday people and even our dumpster diver street people. I just, anyway, <laughs> there's, there's a little couple that's, that's camped out next to my coffee shop down by the river and, and the creek was rising and um, uh, last night or, or night before last and I had to go down there um, and well, that's the funny thing in America, our poorest people have cell phones. Mm-hmm. I mean, just let that sink in. And, and and when people say, "Yeah, but they're living out of dumpsters," it's like, okay, would you like to live out of a uh, out of a dumpster in Zambia or a dumpster in America? And it's like the the poor people, by comparison, are ridiculously wealthy. Doesn't mean we shouldn't take care of them. I took them and and uh, uh, helped get their stuff to high ground, and and I gave them a night or two in the uh, you know a local uh, hotel or motel or whatever you know motel eight. And, um, uh, but, but the, the point is it's the entire economy from, from any business you can think of for it to exist, it must be meeting a need, which is, which is why central governments are so wicked in that in the long run, they destroy the ability of people to meet needs because the government decides which needs will be met and who will meet them and lets nobody see. Let's nobody come along to come up with a better way. When you do it God's way, you have 5 billion people on the planet thinking most of their day, how can I come up with something that will meet someone's needs? Because when you do, there's enough wealth now in society to where they can can trade their, what would it be, excess wealth. They, that's what, what money and savings and stocks and bonds and Bitcoin, so what all that stuff represents is what do we do with our excess wealth? How can I store it so that I can then use it later? And, and we're finding ways that we can trade that excess wealth. And the other uh, benefit of the cross is we're constantly uh, redistributing every, every trade, every decision is a redistribution of wealth. Uh, you can't help but do it because I give you something, you give me something. Um, anyway, that's that's what the cross is. And so when you see that, um, it's kind of a throwaway line uh, for for most theological positions, but it's central to what I'm saying. He's the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. That apart from sin, a cr- the cross is still a measure of how we how we interact with each other, and create good societies according to God's law. Because with sin, 
becomes an instrument of punishment and torture, and then something that, that I put you on to meet my needs. Boy, you're going to do this for me, and you're going to do that, and you become my slave. And, and uh, if you're just a servant, I spit on you. Um, and hurry up and get it done. And, and Jesus comes, and he takes that as a punishment and as a shame and as a degradation, and he reestablishes it as a tree of life again. Uh, I, I just jump metaphors. The tree of life turns into a cross of destruction until Jesus hangs on it. And that's why he said, eat the fruit of that tree. And that's how you have life. When you eat of Jesus Christ, he's the fruit of the tree of life. And he turns the cross back into the instrument or the pattern for us being able to do amazing things. Seeing that everywhere, I've learned that talking that way kind of weirds a lot of the people that I know. It weirds them out. I, yes, I remember walking uh, out of a gas station one time and I saw, I think it was, it was three stink bugs or three praying mantises or something like that. But you could tell it was two males going at it and you had the female, this much smaller one, like off to the side and you could tell they're fighting for the female. And I'm like, uh -huh. well, there's your little picture of the gospel right there. You got <laughs> Christ fighting death to get his bride. <laughs> And I had somebody yeah. next to me, I could tell they had never thought about it that way before, but they also weren't impressed at all. They kind of like just shrugged and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> and I stood there and watched them for five minutes. And uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, you go and you buy something at a, at a restaurant. Well, what are you doing? You're, you're redeeming uh, uh, a cup of coffee from bondage. And now it's my possession and I, it gets to serve me. Yes. So, yes. yeah, economy, I mean, it literally is oikonomos, law of the house, God's law, the law of God's house. That's how I think of it. Yeah. So how did you first come into contact with Bo? It, it was uh, it was actually probably about 10 years after Operation Rescue. Um, I was, I had just discovered gary north's uh chat rooms um which i i didn't even know there are gary north's chat rooms uh I, I really am technologically uh retarded but i did know enough to be able to go on there's a lot of interesting stimulating conversation and forums probably forums okay. forums and and honestly i wouldn't know the difference uh it, it was it was places where you could get it, it was kind of like a facebook kind of format mm -hmm. you know just the software is cold stream or something like that. And, and there'd just be threads and you'd argue, then you'd look for another thread that you thought might be more interesting. And, and um, what I noticed after about six months was there was this guy and he and I were always teaming up on people um, and, and just coming at them from a perspective they'd never thought of before. Um, and, and it was like, it, it was pretty strange because I had normally, when I run into people like that, after a while, I find out that, that I don't know, they, there'll be something about me that they don't like. I'm, I'm, I'm the, theologically, philosophically. So they're on some topics we're together with, with this guy. It was like, we're pretty much lined up. We, we, we just thought the way each other thought. And, um, so, so finally I contacted him by email, um, and asked him, um, uh, you know, where he's from. And he, he said, where do you live? He said, Bulgaria. I said, we, yeah, but, it, but I mean, in America is so I've never been to America. And, um, looking at his English, it was flawless. And I had him pegged for probably Southern California. Uh, just, just the structure of his English just sounded like people from Southern California, the way they write, you know, when, when they're posting like that. And he says, no, no, I says, I've never been further west than Germany. I said, you've got to be kidding me. Who are you? And so we we start emailing back and forth. And uh, I don't know if I talked him into it or I don't know if he decided this is a good time for it. But he came to America um, and lived with us for about six months. And um, we went on a tour around the country. Uh, because between me and the other uh, elders of the church, uh, we had a pretty extensive um, circle of, of, of 
places we could go and visit. And Bo basically went around. We we drove around the country for about two months um, together. He was, and he would preach in all these different churches and and meetings, and people would get together and organize for him. And and uh, he just presented what he was doing in Bulgaria, which was a, a essentially a trans a translation project of all the reconstructionist literature, theonomic literature into Bulgarian. So there would be a foundation for a Bulgarian Reformation. Uh, and, and he had translated a whole bunch of stuff into Bulgarian. Uh, and, and now there were about, uh, at that time, about five or six other people on that translation team. And he would then, then do the final, I mean, his, his, his English was stunning. I'm, I'm, I mean, just when you hear him talk, it's like his accent has not improved in 20 years <laughs> uh, at all. It, as near as I can tell, he sounds just as much like a, like a Bulgarian redneck as, as he did when I first met him. Um, but the first but, time uh, my sister uh, heard him speak, he, she said, he, you guys remember that animated movie, Anastasia? He sounds just like Bartok the Bat. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's it's the German accent we associate with Nazis, and it's the uh, the the Slavonic accent that we associate with uh, communists or or Russians, just evil yeah. r- uh, Russians. Um, anyway, so that's and 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 after living together for about six months, um, the really remarkable conclusion that we both came to is is basically we think alike. We, I'm, I'm not saying that, that, that we agree with everything or that our style is even mildly similar. It's just we attack intellectual issues and problems the same way. And uh, uh, I have no prop. All the different times that he gets all nasty on people and, 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 and nobody likes him because he's so mean and harsh. Um, I could go back up in the conversation and nobody ever listens to me because by then they're usually so butthurt. There's no point in it. Um, and just show them how Bojar gave them an answer that was over their head. And rather than going back, and, and then when they re-asked the question, indicating they had no idea what he was talking about, which also meant they have no idea what the issue is, um, that rather than just stopping and getting him to define his terms and, and discovering what it is they had missed, um, they'll just start attacking. And almost every time, they're the first person to say, something nasty and you only got to do that to, to Bo once and then he will dump <laughs> he will get bulgarian on your hiney <laughs> you do have to hit first uh that's kind of the rule with, with bugs bunny if he he won't fight you back on, but you have to provoke him and then he will yeah and i he's also charismatic i don't know if people are aware of that because i think it's almost as if he's on a mission from god to offend people so that the only people who are left are really, really tough. Because I think in his mind, what's coming is not going to be good, good years. And it's going to take people sure. of, of mental rigor. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and he's doing him a favor in that respect. Um, yeah, and that's, yeah. everybody's got a certain gift with reaching out to certain types of people. And it's like, all right, my crowd is the thick skinned people. Okay. <laughs> if that's what you're cut out for, then you're the best person for him. Yeah. So, but he and I probably talk, oh, I don't know, once a year, once every six months. Um, and uh, I, anyway, he, he said to me once, he says, you know what? You make life so hard on yourself because you keep trying to talk to people who will never understand. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> my mom okay. gets on to me about that sometimes. She's like, yeah, Adam, what you're saying is good, but there, you've got all these people hanging around who don't know where to put what you're saying. So maybe you should uh, only speak to the people who can understand you. I'm like, okay, well, there's definitely some truth to that. That's definitely a wise thing to do. Um, well, but then again, those people form groups called things like the Orthodox Presbyterians, the Hard Shell Baptists, um, and everybody's going to hell but them. Yeah. There's always a ditch on both sides of the road. Yep. You mentioned patriarchy and I hear people talk a lot about it. I'm guessing um, this would be your definition is kind of the, 
uh, what, where is it in the New Testament that says that husbands are to live with your wives in an understanding way? That the patriarchy movement basically just kind of ignores that. They say, I really don't have to understand. It's, I say this and my wife and my family are supposed to do this with, without asking questions. And I don't really have to try to understand them or um, figure out what their needs are type of thing. Would that be accurate? Most modern patriarchs, patriarchy people are better than that. And of course I say better than that because I reject the model. Um, patriarchy of 80 to 100 years ago, yes. It, it's, it's um, why do you have to do what the captain says? Because it'll be mass chaos if you don't. Uh, the idea that we can all do our jobs was inconceivable. My rejection of patriarchy is is not based on that. Uh, it's based on the idea that somehow, because of your status, in the case of patriarchy, you're a male and you're married. Or you're just a male and therefore the only one fit to hold office. It's based on your ontology, on your physical status. Um, the reason I reject that is very simply, there is only one God and there is only one word. And even if a child articulates the word correctly, your task is to submit to that child on that point. The reason patriarchy people have a hard time with that is they stick with their rigid concept of how government works. And so a child obviously cannot run the organization. A child can't run the family. And so they have this idea that, that, that being in charge means you set the policy, you run it, you discipline it, you enforce it. You hold an office, and an office is defined as, if you're in it, you have these powers and these responsibilities, such as they are. They can be written down and laid out. If you read a book on, on um, Christian marriage, you'll usually see uh, the various responsibilities in the home broken down by status. Uh, and, and basically what it comes down to is because she is not a man, the woman must agree and go along with, with the man. And because he is a man, he has to be right. And what's lost is the word of God is final, not just status. There is no status, which, which allows you to force anybody to, to rebel against, to go along with you and, and to break with God's word. Mm-hmm. That, that's just a broad now it gets real nuanced from that point but but whenever a patriarchy person starts saying yes and and by the way most of them do today yes you're right we're we're to obey the word of god they've already blown up their position it's done it's not your status it's the word of god that was kind of the biggest thing that god had to try to drill into the israelites because they're like it's my blood i'm i'm basically guaranteed because of my biology, my historical biological lineage. Yeah. And God's like... He versus the rest of the world. It never was that way. He used that as a picture, but if you go outside that picture, there's something more fundamental than your blood. It's your, do you do what I say? Do you obey, do you obey God or not? That goes all the way back to Hosea. God tells yeah. him to name the, the two kids, uh, no mercy and not my people, because... You, I will not give you mercy, and you're not my people. Yeah. yeah. Well, Amy. So that's that's the fundamental problem I have with with all ideas that we're going to govern our affairs. We're going to organize based on giving people the power to control us based on who and what they are. And before Christ. The alternative was anarchy. You had the fall, and how are you guys going to get along now? You, you had the hard hearts. You can't do it because of the hardness of your heart. God gave you divorce and things like that. God gave you this, this uh, law. Um, what you find in salvation, and by Jesus putting the emphasis on discipleship, not the sword, um, 
And it's not that he said, go get rid of your swords. I don't think he was a pacifist. It's the sword is no longer the principle that ordains the government or our organization or the group. It's not the, the person leads not based on the fact that, that uh, he has been given, the group has agreed that we're going to let you discipline us. We're going to let you lead us and you just tell us what to do. That's, that's not the basis of leadership. The basis of leadership um, is you're gifted. Well, you're not gifted in the sense that you, you hold an office. You're gifted in that we found that if you come to me to pray, you're probably going to stay sick. But if you call Adam to pray, you'll get better. So who do you think they're going to call? Who are you going to call? You know, um, you, you're in an argument with your wife. Well, we find that if we talk to Foreman, the wife's, you know, see, I told you, and I'm saying, no, I told you. But if we talk to Adam, he resolves the issue. Who has the gift? You do. It, it's, it's just real simple. That really goes um, back to the economic aspect of it. It's like everybody's yes. their own little government. If they do a good job, then you give them your business. And if they don't, you take it somewhere else. Yes, right. And and that motivates them. So now let's 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 go back to Deborah. Did somebody come along to young Deborah when she was 20 or so and say, We now make you a judge over Israel? They never would have crossed the, only the line. Way she got to be a, right. The only way she got to be a judge in Israel is people started bringing their disputes to her. And it worked. She, she resolved the problem. And when they didn't want to go along with what she said, the neighborhoods would say, uh, 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 you're going to do what Deborah says, and would back up her word, exactly the way Moses said to do it. You have a judge, and, and everybody is to execute their word. There was, no, there was no executive in the law of Moses, which is something that I find very difficult to point out to theonomists. Because theonomists, I mean, I was there. They they cut their teeth on the law of God and its stipulations uh, are binding for today. And man, is that exciting stuff. And people really get into it. But come along and say, you're right, the law of God. You know, definitely, we need to stone people. Uh, where's the exec, where's the gover where's the governing structure in the law of God? It's there isn't one. Being, it's held by all the people. All the people are supposed to stone. It's not, yes. you don't hire an executioner that does it. It's witnesses first and then everybody, because everybody has that executive authority. And so, in the same way that we can have a hung jury, you can have a hung execution. Sure. That's exactly what, what you, you, well, you can go both ways, right? You can nullify or you can nullify guilt or nullify innocence. Right. Just like they did, the Jews did with Jesus. Pontius says, Pilate's like, well, he's innocent. And they're like, kill him anyway. We'll take responsibility for it. Right. On us and on our children. And then people say, 70 AD, that was just the sacking of Rome. No, it was it was their new husband decided he didn't like his <laughs> wife. <laughs> yeah, God handed him over to Rome and removed his uh, protection from them. Yeah. So, but, but at any rate... Uh, it's 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 that idea that we are being disciple. Jesus took a discipleship approach uh, because he wanted more than what an executive ruler ultimately re wielding a sword, either literally or figuratively, in the sense of of, of other forms of organization. Uh, whatever the the one in charge can do to punish, whatever it might be, um, he didn't. He didn't want that to be the limit of what the kingdom of God could accomplish. He wanted the kingdom of God to be something that grows out of, out of your innermost being shall flow the rivers of living waters. How could that happen? Because your heart has gone from stone to being flesh. Well, how can this be? Well, it's because you become a new creature and you're now fulfilling uh, Genesis 127 and, and making it the new creation the way you were supposed to be. Well, the first thing you got to do is overcome your sin. We really haven't done a good job of that. But if you look around, this is one of the really one of the reasons why I can work with these hyper liberal kids is 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 because um, so much of of biblical ethics has been translated into their cultural ideals. These are like the the grandchildren of the '60s, and what do they want? They want the world. 
They want peace. They want the world to love each other. Their ideals are so alien to the uh, virile Roman ideal, uh, which, which in many ways Christians have kind of brought that into Christian ethics. Uh, and, and so they're always, they're always open to my explanations as to what Jesus did and what Jesus said. And I can usually get them to listen just by saying, Christians don't get this. You know, one of them is like on the Trinity. Um, I asked one kid, this is after knowing he's, he'd been working for me for about a year. And he was a really thoughtful guy. He was a senior and he was getting ready to go on. And uh, his major was ecology, ecological studies. I don't know what you do with a major like that, but he was pretty optimistic. And uh, that, I think he's going to wind up in a few years in that tent down by the river uh, <laughs> <laughs> studying the ecology of the creek. But anyway, um, and, and, and I said, you know, something I've never understood is, is how Buddhism or, or oneness thinking can be used as a model for uh, uh, ecology and taking care of our habitat. Uh, and and protecting the rainforests and you know stopping CO two emissions, I don't get how it can do that. And here you have in Christianity a perfect model for ecology. Um, but you know what, customers coming in, uh, we can talk about it later if you're interested. And uh, three or four times that I've done that, within the week they're back saying, okay, what do Christians have that, that's a better model? And so. Just say, well, I know that you're serious about really wanting to to be an authentic human being. So, so you've meditated before, right? And what do you? Could you just describe to me what you do when you meditate? Because I, I I want to be sure that I'm I'm understanding you. Because I mean, you know, you might have a better model. I, I I don't know. So explain. Well, you try to shut out everything and become one with. And they they basically describe the normal oneness meditation thing. And I said. How was it? I said, what? I said, well, here you are talking to me. Did that meditation make you one with the world? Uh, yeah, but you're back here talking to me. Obviously, the world, if it's an illusion, is overpowering you so that it, at rare moments you get one with it. Or um, if you ever really were one with it, you would not have the differentiation uh, to be able to even experience it. You would have to, I said, isn't this kind of like having the best sex that's ever conceivable, but you don't remember it? What, what good is that? <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's like, it's, it's, it, doesn't it strike you as a bizarre position? And out of that, how are you any different from a tree? And you might say, well, it means I'll take care of the tree like I take care of myself. Really? You're sitting on a wooden chair. Is that taking care of the tree? That sounds like slavery to me. And so walking through, okay, fine. What is it Christianity does? I said, well, God's three persons, yet he's one. And if you look at everything in creation, from your own personality to the way government works, to the way there's differentiation and everything, except this seems all unified, you can't explain it. The whole world is like that. So now we can understand that we, we take care of creation. And, and, and a tree is valuable because it's a tree, because God made it to be incredibly useful as a thing of beauty or as a chair you're sitting on. You know, it, it just and it's the trinity and then going through how how then from from there everything is based on the fact that that for some reason we, we prefer anything to walking with god and yet he died for our sins what does this mean it means that uh instead of a tree being used as a cross to kill you and now creation being hostile to you it means that now you have the ability to reach out and actually make amazing things and just you know, we go into that, and, and that goes into ethics, and that goes into all the other stuff. So, um, we we have all kinds of of, of theology, what would otherwise be considered seminary conversations on theology, and they're fascinated by it. Wasn't it Rush Dooney that said uh, that the Trinity is the satisfaction of the argument of the one and the many, because yes. you've got God being three and one. That's basically the whole argument and, and you're right all, all i'm doing whenever whenever i get sidetracked i just go back to let me see one of the many okay where do we go from here right <laughs> and that's fascinating to me because it's it's you've got the eastern 
religions that focus on the unity and the oneness meditation stuff, and they sort of deny the the diversity. And then you've got the Western is probably more of on the everything is different and its own thing, and like there's nothing connected. I'm my own person. It's like pure rugged American, uh, right? Libertarianism or whatever. Like, I, am I my brother's keeper? Type of thing, type of attitude. Versus, it's funny the Middle Eastern, <laughs> the where where all this stuff originated from with Abraham. It's a full recognition of both, and they're not in conflict. Somehow, they're they can both be at the same time, but they're also separate. Yes, yes, and 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 that's also in in a building. The um, everything is one, and everything is the mathematical model is everything is infinitely describable. And that it's infinitely mathematical, which means it's infinitely describable. And yet all you've got are a bunch of useless pieces. Mm -hmm. And this is why almost every world religion tries to put it together. The Eastern by just saying that, that a differentiation is an illusion. The Western by realizing something's got to hold it together. And the best government forms they've been able to, to come up with are, are the Christian, which is we vote and and we, and we try to pick the best policies as a group working together, um, and 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 out of at, out of that the um, uh, we we realize there's not sufficient unity, so people turn to various forms of socialism, um, and and a Karl Marx um, has has made an ideal out of infinite diversity that's held together by the central party that forces conformity on us. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there we go in a lot of directions I, I find libertarianism another huge bridge into that community sure um, because um, uh, well anyway just what, what, one of the problems with Christianity that is, and I don't mean where Christianity is, is like wrong and I figured it out why they're wrong and I got to correct them it's just as a Christian culture, we are Newtonian. Catholics are are a, ancient mystical, but evangelicals are Newtonian. We're now moving into a postmodern world. It just doesn't work. Just to give you an example, when I was young, I remember witnessing to a person, and I just read, uh, uh, I don't know, Josh McDowell, I think he was just preaching, he hadn't even written his book yet. But just these, you know, there, there are books out about 51 proofs of the resurrection. And um, he uh, uh, got done, brilliant job of it. And the person says, you know, it's interesting, but who's to say uh, it's, it's an open universe. I might come back from the dead. Who knows? In fact, I'm not even sure I'm ever going to die. Because, you know, then, then he, and, and I realized um that's actually when I became a presuppositionalist. I was about 14 or 15. And I was actually talking to my cousin. Um, very, very interesting girl who went on to become a, the chairman of the Peace Department at Notre Dame. And uh, we've, we've, we've kept in touch over the years. But she sort of began a lot of my... In fact... I hate to say that I shouldn't tell anybody this. She 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 radicalized my view of, of what you do at communion. Um, she wanted to get married. She wanted me to perform the service. This is later on in her life. I was in seminary at the time. And um, uh, she said that she wanted to have communion at the wedding service. I, I was saved by the fact that she, she was going to be marrying a Catholic boy. So it wasn't going to happen. Um, but anyway... <laughs> Uh, he was not going to be taking communion from me, that's for sure. And I said, well, because I'm, I'm thinking I may be the only Christian in the room. So I was thinking about handing out communion to her or anybody else. And, um, and, and, and I said, well, wouldn't my job be to protect the wrong people from eating and drinking damnation upon themselves? Hint, hint, cousin. Um, and, and she just with a complete straight face says, everything you've taught me. I'm surprised that you would even ask that question. I was trying to imagine what I had taught her. And she, she, said, um, she said, the table of God is an invitation to come and eat with them. 
with the statement that if you eat this food and drink this, this blood, you are professing faith in the living God who died for you. This is what she said. And I was like, well, that's really cool. When did I ever say that? <laughs> she said, so there's no reason why you can't put out an invitation like that and invite people who, who have come to Christ uh, to be able to come take communion. And I'm, I'm like, wow, here I am, the great reformed, you know, Francis Schaeffer, uh, you know, the mini Francis Schaeffer. And that never occurred to me that God is inviting us and you use this as an invitation and you tell the person, um, if you come, you are professing faith in Christ. And if you're not, if that's not where you were, you're the biggest hypocrite in the world. Stay in your seat. Um, so it, it, it's a, anyway, as I say, I usually shouldn't tell people that because then they, all my good Reformed Presbyterian brethren are like, well, you know, you just let just anybody up there. But I always ask people, um, where did Paul tell elders that they need to be sure that the right people are taking communion? Well, of course, it's uh, it's it's 1 Corinthians 11. Why don't you go read the verse and see who does the examining? Let each one examine themselves. So Paul is saying, let the drunks examine themselves. And by golly, if they want to eat and drink damnation upon themselves and die, there's the table. You've come into the presence of the living God. And if you're stupid enough to take it lightly, there's not an elder on earth that can help you by disciplining you or holding you back. Mm -hmm. God can stand on his own two feet. It's his body, his blood. He doesn't, it's, it's not a game of um, keep away or capture the flag. And you have to the body convince me that you're is our flag. Right. You have to convince us all that you're worthy of it before we'll let you near it. Exactly. And, and, and then, of course, once you've convinced us, you're in unless you really screw the pooch. And it's like, then you get various trials of people who have screwed the pooch as if your sins and my sins don't bar us from the table as, as much as that horrible guy over there sleeping with his mother or father's wife or whatever was going on. Uh, and and I, just, I just don't see Paul saying um, that, that uh, uh, well, the fact is, with all the problems in Corinth, Paul never said, your problem is you don't have elders. Paul never said, get some elders so that you can fix these problems. And he never said, uh, if you have elders, this will solve them. And he, he never said, I want the elders to get together and do this, 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 and this. Everything he said was, a, was an address to a church without authority structure. And if somebody were to say, well, then you see how bad the Corinthians were. I'm not sure the Corinthians were that different from most churches. Um, there's sexual sin going on in churches. There's theological sin going on in churches. There's political sin going. I mean, he opens a thing with political problems. You know, there's some who say this, there's some who say that. And, you know, it's probably got to be that way. So the, those who are right can stand up. And, you know, and, and uh, when I come, basically, he was going to debate those who claim to be apostles, and the congregation was going to be the jury. The, there wasn't, this wasn't an elders thing. It wasn't like he's going to get together with the elite of the church. Um, well, we, we, we went on the track of elders. Um, well, that's something that I've been thinking about. I think I asked this question in another group, um, thinking about if I, I just got to thinking about if, if I had a serious disagreement with somebody, um, or I've seen somebody commit like a serious sin, like who, who would I trust enough to go to and say, like, we need to either approach this guy because either I can tell when we approach him, he's not going to take it. And then that's going to go on the whole church discipline track. Or if it's something involving me personally, where I might have to take uh, some kind of punishment for something, either somebody brings something against me or I'm looking for it's monetary compensation, something like that from somebody else. Cause it's like major enough to where it would, I mean, it would destroy me if I didn't get this. Um, where, like who, who would I trust enough to go to? 
And when I got to thinking about that question, it was like, it would actually kind of depend on what it is. Like there's not one person that I would trust for like every different type of matter. And I'm not sure if that's a good position to be in or a bad position to where I'm like, okay, well, um, thinking about it in terms of judges, if there was a judge, I wanted somebody to go be a mediator or solve this problem for me. I don't want to be stuck in a position of like, well, I, who can I take this to? Who's going to make a decision in my favor? I don't want to be thinking in that sense. So it's like, it doesn't want to, I don't want to pick somebody that I agree that agrees with me on everything because two years from now, I'll disagree with them on some stuff. Cause I'm always changing. <laughs> yeah. How should, how should that work of like elders? Are these, are those, is it an elder? Is a, is a church judge a separate office from an elder? Is it fluid? Um, ideally it's, you know, you have the example before God even told Israel how to do it. It was Jethro's Jethro's advice to Moses, which was, yeah. you, you know, have the people choose among themselves, like tens, fifties, hundreds, thousands. I, I think you put your finger on it there. Um, it's, it starts by going to the people who are doing the eldering. Who is it? Who's discipling? Who is it that the people come to for judgment? Uh, if people aren't coming to you for judgment, to resolve issues, to find out what to do, you're probably not elder material. <laughs> that's uh, that's and, actually but, one of the things that was kind of eye-opening to me because when I started thinking about that question, I was like, okay, so when I joined, I joined this local body of believers, and before I knew anybody, they assigned me an elder. And I think I have spent in the last year plus, I don't think I've spent two hours with him. Yeah. He's just not available. He, he works full time. He's got a family. He's got other responsibilities. And I'm like, how can I take an issue to somebody that I've basically never don't know and never met? Like I've never been to his house. He's never been here. How can you expect people to solve their issues if they don't know anybody well enough? Exactly. I think the eldership, I think the concept of office, notice I always use this hand motion for office. Okay. It's, it's like a, it's like a cylinder for some reason in my head. It's like a cylinder. And inside, if you take the, screw the lid off, you're going to find these are the things which you, which you've been given as areas where you respond, your jurisdiction, where you're supposed to do something. And these are the powers, the way you can hurt people if they don't go along with you. Those are your powers. Uh, the proper reform people call them your, your sanctioning thing. Okay. The way that completely messes up the picture of elder is that it assumes that if, if, if I, Am, am a good businessman or a good father or a good whatever, and you then stand me up in front of the church, lay hands on me, unscrew your jar and hand it to me and say, now here's, your, here's the things you're supposed to do and here's the power you have to do it with. Uh, you and, and we get together as elders and we talk about basically the rumors of the church uh, to find out if, if, if we've heard of anybody that, that, that needs going after. And if we do, we call them to examine them. And, and in most churches, well, never mind whether the real world, that's, that's kind of how it works. I, I think God had a completely different picture in mind. Uh, there's no jar of tools and powers that can be given to you to enable you to be a, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a shepherd, that, that same one, um, butcher, baker, candlestick maker. What are those, those, the, the, the uh, charismatics on the, the fivefold gifts? I, I can know more if you were going to my church, give you this office and fly to the moon. The elders can't give it to you. You have to have it. Um, you have to be somebody who can do it. If, if we decide that we're going to lay hands on you 
uh, and you'll get it. Well, very quickly we'll find out whether or not the Lord chose you. I mean, it may there are people uh, who the church needed a. I think Andre Crouch was one of them uh, when he was about six or seven. You know who Andre Crouch is? I've heard the name. He's I a don't... black singer. He's a black singer from the sixties through the nineties. Okay. Um, <laughs> and uh, Christian, and and basically his church laid hands on him because they needed a a musician about age eight or nine. He started playing the piano and played the and you know he, he's an amazing jazz musician. My uncle, not my uncle, my brother-in-law, Peter Jones. Uh, I, I don't know if you've ever heard of him in, in a Southern California. Uh, apparently, he grew up in a little charismatic storefront type church. I heard different stories about it. But he's an amazing jazz musician. And and not only that, went to school with John Lennon. Um, and, and, and in the 7th through 6th through 7th and 8th grades, um, in, in a Liverpool is is a, one of the people who got him interested in in, in the potential for music. It, I, I think at that time it was Chicks Dig It. Um, <laughs> whether this is myth or not, I do know that he was a friend of John Lennon's, <laughs> uh, and he is a great jazz musician. Um, but the 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 point of it is, though things like that can happen. By and large, we have it completely backwards. When Paul tells Timothy. Go into the churches and gives them a checklist. It's not just out of the blue to 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 go down the checklist to see if he can appoint somebody. Is who's the guy who's you know he doesn't know a whole lot about the church there in Cyprus. Okay, so he goes and he fellowships with them for a month or two. Who are the people who are kind of running things? What what's there to be? Are they good with their family? Are they good? Uh, can they teach? Do people respect them? Are they are they well thought of? You know, and and those are the boxes you're going down to somebody who's doing the ministry. They're not the boxes you go down to any Tom, Dick, and Harry's in the church who's a good businessman or whatever, um, and 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 say, well, let's now give you the jar, uh, which 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 we will call the ordination, and and show you your responsibilities and your powers. It's it's got a completely bass backwards, um, so that that's uh, and and as far as appointing goes, I can tell you this. I mean, I don't get how people who are good Presbyterians don't don't just intuitively understand with their experience organizing things because that's what Presbyterians do. We organize everything um, that you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. You can't pick somebody and make them a good elder or a good deacon or a good anything. You can't pick a girl and make her a good wife. You can't pick a, a boy and make him a good husband. There has to be something there that's that's, that's proven, a track record. Um, and uh, unless marriage is to be nothing but a business relationship, parents can't pick them for, for their kids. They'll pick all the wrong. <laughs> In one sense, I understand that. In another sense, God did choose Israel because... There wasn't. They were empty. They were a, a humble, lowly people, in that sense. And God True. decided to make something out of that, out of them, and illustrate His point that way. That I can't argue with that, but I'm not sure that that is an argument against what I said. Well, right, and and it's also <laughs> I won't disagree with it. It was also the the longest road to hoe, as far yeah. as as far as God. Maybe God chose them because they were going to be the most difficult people of anybody on earth. So God's uh, loving kindness could be magnified. Like yeah. if it was just an easy process he, and, you know, God wouldn't be that great. But it's like, no, this is a pretty stubborn and rebellious people. God's really long suffering, isn't he? Yeah. And I also think that, that coming into contact with God's law. I've been trying to figure out why is it that no matter what the, the revival is, no matter what the move of the Holy Spirit is, and, and I'm not just talking about the revivals in the English-speaking world, but or you know, worldwide, apparently there's stuff going on in Africa and things. Uh, apparently there's, there's something going on in, in Iran. I don't know if anybody's ever told anybody, but all the people having these visions and everything are, are, are mostly the women. Um, and, and they're the ones who Jesus is appearing to, uh, 
and most of the original anyway just for for whatever that's that's worth why is it that whatever the re, the revival might be it ends with a set of rules you know you're a very holy guy man i can't believe how holy you are um i really sense my sin and i want to be holy like you are what did you do well I don't know. I, I get up early in the morning and pray, and I read my, yeah, you, know, you go down the list of holiness. And so now we write a book that says, well, it, you know, Foreman, if you want to be holy, uh, be like Adam, get up early in the morning and pray, and you, know, you go through the list of holinesses. Well, is that going to make me holy? Of course not. Because what you've left out is, why do you get up early in the morning? You know, why do you do each one of those check things on the list? And this is kind of like the elder. You do it because your heart's been changed. You don't do it in order to have a, I guess, a worship experience. Uh, you're not a Buddhist. A Buddhist does it so that he can enter into that oneness. And, and in a sense, that is a fringe benefit of Christianity. It's like righteousness is a great means of gain. But oddly enough, Paul says, but not for those who try to use it that way. <laughs> Which I think is one of the great verses of the Bible. Because it says, of course, righteousness is good. But not if you're going to pursue righteousness for that reason. It's like you can't even pursue righteousness for righteousness' sake. It's walking with the Lord. It's like it's like your wife greeting you and saying, you know what, Adam? God showed me. And I've just written a book on all the things I can do to please you. I'm going to be the best wife. And I suspect in the beginning that might have some, you know, I mean, it's like most most of our ale, ma, ale migos, male egos would like respond very positively to that. You know, the separate, I got my own separate wife. This is awesome. Um, <laughs> who needs androids? Uh, and, and yet, I don't think we would find that satisfying. What do we want? We want somebody who loves us. For us. And, and that's what they're looking for. They're looking for somebody who loves them. Because their, their performance as a wife is going to be good or bad on any given day. And so is mine as a husband. The real question is... There isn't a set of rules that will make it so she can please me. Because in the end, I've got to decide to be pleased and vice versa. I can't do things to please her because in the end, she's got to be pleased. And I can't say, I mean, just those of you who are husbands or wives who happen to be listening to this, just imagine at the end of the day, you say, you know what, honey? And right now I could be the husband or the wife. I did this, 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 and this for you. You need to be thankful for me. I mean, how how is that going to make intimacy that night work? Uh, it ain't going to happen. It's backwards. It's yeah. I want to please this person, and I know they they enjoy these things. Therefore, I'm going to do them. Versus, these are the things that I want to do, and you better appreciate it. It's right. like, are you starting with your happiness or their happiness first? And then patriarchy gives you go, goes even further than that, and just says, uh, you know, here's the what I can't tell you how many stories like this I've heard, both from men who who handed out his advice. This, I, my wife found this very helpful, uh, as as well as women who said, "I will never have anything to do with patriarchy because my husband did this." As a wife, they're they're they're, they're struggling, you know, like. Every wife does. I mean, every husband does. Be being a mom and a dad and a husband and a wife isn't always a straight, straightforward road to bliss that we would like it to be. Um, and so the husband s s sits his wife down and comes up with a checklist of things that she needs to do to organize her life and be happier. Um, and I've seen a guy that, that uh, I, I think we're good friends now, used to edit Patriarchy magazine, actually recommended that in a sermon once um and and i remember sitting thinking huh i wonder if he really does i, I mean i know his wife he doesn't give her a checklist <laughs> and uh they're, they're both dear people I, I mean i don't i don't have something against patriarchy stuff personally because if the husband is a very strong guy and the wife if if they look like they're a patriarchal cousin, couple, if that's how they work well together, they're one flesh. Work it out. Do it that way. 
uh, it's, it's just it's not made right because he's the man. It's made right because given their mix of personality and their unity and everything else, that's how it works. You know, it, it's I, I, I don't have a problem with that. Um, and this guy, he was he was talking about it for another purpose, but he's told a story of like three three different ways uh, that a taxi driver and a passenger three ways their relationship could go. You could either be just a robot that, as the taxi driver, like you could just take their instructions, exactly what they tell you to do, this turn, that turn, what's your speed, break harder for the stoplight, that type of stuff, micromanaging type things. And for some people, that's exactly what they need. They know what they want. They know exactly where they're going. But it's also like really stressful as the taxi driver. Like you're a taxi driver, if if you're any good at your job, you know what you're doing, you know how to get them there, probably even uh, faster than yes. if that's what they want. If they want to get there fast, you probably know a shortcut that they don't because uh, you drive taxi more than they do. Um, so that's there's one that's the stressful, I would imagine, sort of the patriarchy way to go about it, dictating every little thing, micromanaging. Um, then there's the. On, that's one extreme. And then the opposite extreme is um, you tell them where you want to go and you actually don't follow their instructions because you know why they're asking to go to this place. There's a flower shop there mm -hmm. and you know it's closed and you know that they've got a wedding that they're preparing for later that day. So you actually go somewhere to another flower shop. Yeah, and, that's, and, that's a good example. And they're happy because you knew exactly what they wanted. Um, but it's, yeah, the idea of, he used it with the idea of like, as a business person, you don't necessarily give people what they're asking for. You satisfy their motivation for asking. Mm -hmm. And I, I've noticed that's changed some of my communication style. And I imagine it's kind of a little bit would play into a marriage communication relationship. I'm not married, but instead of telling people exactly how to do things or what I think I want, I I state the problem as um, this is why I want this to be this way. And then that gives them the total freedom to be creative with how to go about solving that problem. And I haven't told them anything to do in particular, and they've got enough information to start brainstorming how they might approach it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We just uh, had a perfect illustration of that. Just the last delivery I made. Remember I said that, that we made the delivery early. There's this um, very wealthy family that has big houses all over the place, and Black Mountain's one of them. And they um, they like Ann to to cook for them when they're in town. And uh, <clears throat> they uh, the wife wants to micromanage the job. And and the thing is, Ann is a brilliant intuitive gifted chef i mean she uh and she loves to take care of you and if you would say i like this 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 and this and i don't like that 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 could you make me a meal and i'm going to have three vegans and you know two vegetarians and 10 carnivores uh she would she would lay on she would go out of her way to 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 make that the best meal you've ever had this is a woman who wants to tell her exactly how to do each part of it and ch change whatever Anna's put together is a typical thing that's a crowd pleaser. And Anna doesn't mind if you say, rather than beans, I'd rather have rice or something like that, unless rice isn't good for you. Just, just to use your, I, I don't mean healthy. I'm, I'm, I mean, it, it doesn't go with that. Or they, a lot of times they'll, se they'll select some kind of rice and some kind of, of corn or mashed potatoes or something it's like yeah you don't want to put those two starches together but 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 going beyond that exactly the way you described it well this is probably the last job we're ever going to do for him we we worked for him for about 10 years now um and uh have, have a very good good relationship with him it, it, except Ann just said you know what this is the last time i'm ever going to work with somebody um who who basically wants to use me so that she doesn't have to do the cooking if those are the meals she wants, she needs to do them. And uh, and the other thing too, or, is or hire a thirteen-year-old. Yeah, 
and it's just she's done. And so any other time, they're it, they're probably going to be wanting to, us, us to do something in August because she has a woman's retreat. And if she would just let Ann cook for the woman's retreat, it would blow them all away. Um, instead, she has to pick <clears throat> pick. Well, you know, when you have eight people and they were doing filming for a book that her husband has just just written. Um, and uh, I, I'm not sure exactly what. It was more than a podcast. It was kind of a teaching video. Uh, and and she um, <clears throat> she was uh, plant-based. There was another woman there that was plant-based and six people that weren't. And and her husband, they, you know, he can swing. He's like me. I'm happy. I can swing both ways on that one. Uh, and and um, she picked a plant-based meal. And I just told the secretary, I didn't tell her, I said, look, if you go with that meal, about two hours after each meal, they're going to be desperate to get a hamburger or pizza or something to fulfill our normal cravings of people who aren't plant-based. Not only that, if you don't have a system that's, that's tr transitioned over to it, you're going to have gastro pain and serious gas for the rest of the meeting. Now, don't get me wrong. That in and of itself could be a lot more interesting and funny than what they're there to do. But they're <laughs> going to all be stuck in the same room together. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's just to illustrate your point. I, I completely agree with you. Yeah, it's really a whole discussion about like the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. You could just think if you want to take all these, you could take every law of Moses as a little micromanagey bit that you're supposed to do. And that's how the Pharisees took it. Like they're tithing mm -hmm. their mint and their dill leaves and cumin and all this stuff. And they're forgetting, they're forgetting the, the spirit behind why does God want you to do that? You're neglecting the fatherless and actually hurting them. Like specifically going after them. Oh, this, this lady's poor. I'm going to take her house. Meanwhile, you're still trying to be fastidious about all the letter of all this type of stuff. And God's like, I don't want to micromanage you. It's, I'm giving you all of these data points. When you put plug them into a spreadsheet, you see a pattern as the whole, and it's supposed to help you make decisions no matter what, even if it's not a specific example that I mentioned. You'll know well, that's good. what to do that's in a good. new scenario. The thing that kicked this off was... Um, uh, Every revival, including the greatest of the revivals, which I think was the Reformation, has ended in various forms of pious legalism. And the fascinating thing about the Reformers and the Puritans, they were genuinely wanting from the heart to be pious, to be holy. And, and, and it wasn't just mechanical. That's, that's what they wanted. And so they have some of the greatest books ever written on how to apply the law to life. And I, it's, it's, I don't know, probably from my youngest years, I just couldn't see that as being a solution. If it was a solution, why are we here in the 60s? That's, that's where I was first you know, reading those books and, and uh, arguing with all different sorts of people. Uh, it's it's kind of like I asked a guy who was meditating. So uh, after getting one with the universe, you're back here in the illusion with me, huh? How's that working out for you? Um, so we now have our book on holiness, our seminar on holiness, and our sermon on holiness, and our our desire to be holy, and our going. Is that really any different in the end from the Buddhist and his relaxation techniques and his his centering techniques and his way of? It, it, it's, it's like a one piece with that whole idea that we can craft the experience that makes us right with God. Um, and so if you're not going to do that, then what is the law there for? Um, yeah, it's there to be applied and carried out, not just to like philosophize about. I think about. it's there... And the answer is yes. Let me say it differently. It's there to be the structuring principle of, of how you make decisions to bless other people. It's, it's how you make the decisions. I can say, take up your cross and follow me. 
What does that mean? Well, we just went through how the cross is the metaphor for all of economics. It's, it's, it's how you make your decisions to meet the other person's need. The reason I'm not an egalitarian, though there's a, a number of important points I agree with them on, is there's nothing less equal than two human beings. So why am I going to pick a word to call us that really only describes the fact that we think that status doesn't give you privilege? Well, as a matter of fact, status does give you privilege. All sorts of things give you privilege. Your whiteness gives you privilege. Uh, my age gives me privilege. Uh, our relative wealth gives it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to bore you, but I mean, all sorts of things give us privilege. Every privilege God has given you, including your status, is to serve. And that's why when he, in, in, uh, in Ephesians 5, where, where Paul says, submit to one another, the woman's statement is really quick and easy. The women got that. The men have been reminding them what submission means in no uncertain terms <laughs> since the dawn of history. All you got to say to them is submit. They know what that means. Okay. They get it. Um, he can't just say submit to a man. That implies the woman is now the president of the house. She's now taken his place. She's removed him from his office. She's usurped. She's a Jezebel. And it's like, so so rather than, you you just can't use those words. This is how authoritarian people think. They think in terms of office and power and position and authority and status and, and all that, that, that sort of stuff. So instead, he starts describing the lowest members of the household, the handmaiden who, who prepares the bath, the handmaiden who dresses, the handmaiden who feeds and cooks. These are things that no man would ever do, ever. This is what the lowest, the, the handmaiden who washes out the, the uh, butt wiping rags and, and, and the menstrual rags, okay? He describes what the job is. And of course, in the 20th century, we're going, ooh la la, I'm giving my wife a bath. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm with my naked wife. And it's like, no, you don't know what a household is. You know, the, we have servants. And what are the servants? Do the servants get anything out of what they do for the wife? Zero, zilch, nada. They might get some status if she's the most beautiful, if she's probably the plumpest, because feeding me, if the diet of the day being plump was not bad. Um, they, they, uh, uh, they may get status that way, but it's, it's the groom that she's being prepared for. And so when he tells the husband, he, he can't just say submit. He'll think that, right, we now have a government that's just been overturned. Instead, he's being told, what is your privilege? I don't know what it is, but as Jesus said, the master sits at the table. I am among you a servant. Okay, you're the master, but instead of sitting at the table, you're, a, you're with her a servant. And it's not even for you that she's looking good. It's for him. She's the bride for him not you. And it's, it's a whole, it's just a whole different way of looking at it. And I guess unless the Lord opens somebody's eyes to that, all they'll be able to see is, is, is either a sexy event uh, of intimacy, but, but that's why at the end of it, if, if you underline all the different times, which Paul refers in the language of what the husband's doing, um, he, he says, you cherish her like you cherish your own flesh. Um, he mentions flesh a bunch of times through there, and then he ends by 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 a quoting Jesus, both of the apostles in in uh, uh, Matthew nineteen, and Jesus to Adam and Eve in the garden, when he says uh, when he calls them one flesh, the father shall leave, what is it the the man shall shall leave his father and mother and be joined to her, and the two will become one flesh, and he makes that the pattern. And he shows how he's caring for somebody who's one with him, not like, not like somebody who's setting policy and giving directions, but is the one who is making somebody infinitely more competent than them. He's the handmaiden. And she, more competent than he, he's making her look good. That's how you submit. And so it's actually a statement of submission that, that really, by the time I'm done, my question is, why did the woman get off so easy? Why, why didn't he tell me to submit and then tell her to wait on me hand and foot? 
it's it's the whole cycle is like the cycle of service like in an economy you got somebody who's doing this one thing and yeah okay they're a great taxi driver but you know what they don't want to do on their day off they don't want to drive anywhere because they've been in the car working all day long they want somebody yeah. else they want somebody else to drive them uh and it's the woman like widows they get special protection if a widow has no help there's no safety net and she drops and she's destitute and she cries out to God. God hears her more readily than she'll, than, than he'll hear a guy who's destitute crying out for help. There's no special protections for, for widowers. It's the widows and the fatherless. Yeah. And so in that sense, she's, if, if you want to be closer to God, it's easier, I think as a woman to do that because you're more predisposed to being humble. Versus guys, it's a real challenge to do that because that's not in our nature. <laughs> I got a question for you. When, when, no, you, you're absolutely right, and it builds exactly off of what you just said. In uh, in Matthew twenty twenty five through about twenty nine, you, you get done at twenty eight, twenty nine, and Jesus. Has has gotten through saying, um, "Don't exercise authority." By the way, there's there's words for abusing authority. There, there's no indication that it's abuse that he's talking about. He's, he says, "Like the kings, don't exercise it." Then he says, "Like the elder brother, the younger brother, the elder brothers to serve the younger brother, uh, the the great are to serve the small, and so forth." Then he says, "The master sits at the table." I am with you a servant. So it's not a huge step, if you'll permit me to put words into your mouth, for you to agree, and most people do, that, that leadership is defined by Jesus as service. Whatever else they may go on from there, the servant leader is like, we all know that word, right? Right. It's kind of the one and the many. You got to have both. Right. Now, who's in charge in the Garden of Eden? Supposed to the be one person. Who's the one person in Eden who's called a servant? Eve. Right. Each one of them had their had their responsibilities. Yeah, I'm she's not. She's the one she's that's called. She was the one who was created to be the helper. Adam was not created for for Eve. And it's mm -hmm. the same. I mean, it's somebody. A friend of mine said God works in uh, fractals, like repeating patterns, circle within a circle within a circle. God creates man, which is his bride. Well, then what does God do for man? He creates a bride for man. And so it's like you got a circle within a circle. Privilege is to serve. True. And, Most people talk about their leader. job as something that they have instead of an opportunity. A job is right, really whatever it is. A job is really an emptiness that you're filling for somebody else. Mm -hmm. Well, how can an emptiness, how can a lack of something be a possession? But that's how we talk about it. Yes, and so the servant is is the one who fills that that need, mm -hmm. and 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 then gives you a value. Sometimes a need that. Nobody really thought could be filled, like air conditioning. Um, <laughs> or an iPhone. Yeah, you don't know that you have a need for it until you see it. So uh, to me, what it does is it blows up the entire concept of authoritarian governing. That I have my status to punish you when you step out of line. When in fact, I have my status to serve you. And if I've served you properly... You're going to listen to me rather than step out of line. That's 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 what discipleship gives you. Going back to the church, the discomfort, you know, for forgive me, I I wasn't there, but it strikes me from your story that the discomfort came from the fact that somebody was in charge who did not know you. And the being in charge was not really clear exactly what it was. It certainly had nothing to do with discipleship. Uh, it might have something to do with, you know, he's, it's kind of like if you got a problem, call him, but do yourself a favor, don't have problems that need calling him. 
Right. Uh, That's what everybody has said. (laughs) But uh, if they had an elder, it would not have been a matter of putting you in, putting him in charge of you, because the in charge is something that is unfundamentally unbiblical. It's fundamentally, as soon as you think of a need to be in charge, uh, then, then you've, you've got a way of organizing apart from Scripture. It doesn't mean you can't organize. It means to the extent that I believe that, that you are biblical and following God, you're in charge. I remember and, looking at the, into the etymology of the word charge, and it, and it comes from, it was like closely associated with the word burden. Um, and it's where we get the idea of like, you charge a battery, you bur- uh-huh. you burden it with power. Well, what, what are batteries for? They're meant to be put in something else so that they can give their power to whatever you put them in. So you've got, uh, a battery that is burdened with power. Well, what is it when it's charged? What does it want to do? It wants to give it away. It doesn't want to keep like absorbing more than its capacity or else it'll blow up. It'll catch fire. Um, so yeah, you, you charge them, you burden them with power so that they can put it where you want it, but they're just Mm -hmm. like a temporary store of power. And that's what I think of somebody being in charge. Um, even just thinking about somebody who's really wealthy, people who have a whole lot of money, you you know what their biggest problem is, is that their money keeps trying to leave them (laughs) through inflation (laughs) or all these other things, moth, you know, the moth devours. Um, And so their, their biggest problem is they're trying to give their money away to other people who will manage it well and keep it from disintegrating. So it's kind of like you've got that, picture of the gospel there. It's like, you, if you want to keep your money, you actually have to give it away to other people. You got to invest it with other people who can use it, who are poor and are, and want to grow. Um, otherwise it'll just dissolve out of your fingertips. Yeah. How did you find Gary North's forums? Where did you know of Rush Dooney before and then Gary North? Yeah. I, I, um, I went to Westminster seminary. And that's the seminary that all the Reconstructionists and theonomists wish they could take over. Was yeah, what didn't uh, uh, wasn't Bonson a professor there? Bonson, no, no, that's where he got his his uh, MDiv. Gary North and Bonson and all the great uh, went to Westminster. Uh, Bonson became a professor at uh, Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson. Thirty five years ago. I would have said he was such an obnoxious SOB that he basically ran himself out of the school because he was a Johnny One Note constantly trying to change everybody's mind on the topic. Now that I'm an old geezer and have had some experience in this area, I don't know that he was trying to change anybody's mind. It's be, because I've been involved in things that when I walk into the room, everybody just assumes I'm there to condemn them. Uh, Operation Rescue being one of them, because we were taking such an aggressive stand against against abortion, um, it was assumed that I th- I just thought you were a sinner unless you went out and did a sit-in with me. And I wouldn't have to say a word, just walk into a room and everybody knows that. And so the what did Foreman talk about? Well, he made us all feel bad that, that we're not righteous like he thinks he is. You know, it's like, that's not what I said at all. So so now as I look back, I'm not so sure that Bonson was that, that SOB that everybody said that he was. It could just be that he quietly, um, people knew what he stood for and when they would argue with him not many people walked away winning that one i mean he was he was one of the brighter boys on the block as they said at westminster the professor said you know anytime gary north or uh, uh bonson came to class you would better have done your homework as a professor <laughs> because they've read all the books you've read and the books you've written uh and they're here to talk about them and um it's a, uh, anyway, that's, that's kind of, they, they did something very interesting when another guy came along who probably is smarter than all of them. That's Fern Poitras, um, who's a professor at Westminster and, and, uh, he really is smart. He has something like three PhDs and 
math and physics and stuff like that. And then uh, in, in the middle of it, he read through almost everything theological that's ever been written. And when he came to Westminster, um, he, uh, uh, they, they designed a program for him, uh, which was he had to write five papers and attend whatever classes he, he felt like would be useful. So he literally spent every minute of every day in a class. I mean, he just one of these, oh, and to keep himself calm, he taught himself uh, how to play concert piano. <laughs> he, he really is smart. <clears throat> but um, he didn't go down that, that, that theonomic ramp. <laughs> so, um, so how did you first uh, learn about Rush Juni or come into contact with Gary North and find his forums? I, I first heard about him. You know, I've, I've never told anybody this. I first ran into him when I was at, at Gordon-Conwell. I spent a year there. Um, and uh, there was a, a student there who was the most obnoxious, shallow person who was a theonomist. And so by and large, I, I got my, my first taste of theonomy just listening to what he said. And it was about as easy to caricature as anything I've heard. Um, but I do remember one thing, and that is if anybody back, you know, as far as asked if I was a theonomist, I would say, of course I am. You know, if you don't honor and respect God's law, what are you? <laughs> and um, this is kind of like people who aren't charismatic or speak in tongues. If you say, are you a charismatic? And they go, absolutely. You think there's such a thing as a Christian who's not filled with the Holy Spirit? Not gifted by God? <laughs> of course, that's not really what they meant. But um, uh then when I went to Westminster, they, there was a whole debate, and that's that's why I first read it. Oh, I first read Rush Dooney when I was a sophomore in college. Uh, his his book on education, and 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 honestly, I I I thought it was humor. I did not know he was taking a serious position. Was that the it just the messianic role of the state in education? Education, yes, yeah. And, and aside from the fact that he had a very funny Dutch name, um, and I found out he's not Dutch, he's Armenian. But anyway, <laughs> but, but I was reading Dory Veard and people like that, and it, it, it sounded Dutch, um, and a Rookmacher. And so I remember reading it and, um, and, and thinking it was so right on, it sounded like humor that was exaggerating everything. And I, I don't know how to describe it, but, but you've heard... Uh, c c well, basically, most good comedians, what they do is they exaggerate everything. And so he just sounded like he was just la lampooning the whole world of modern education. And I thought he was right on target as a comedian. In other words, it, it's, you know, the fool makes you laugh because he's telling you things that are true in a way that's funny. And so <laughs> that's that's why he hangs around the court saying true stuff that's funny. And we call him a fool. And, and so I just kind of put Rush Judy into that category. And, and thought thought uh, nothing more for about another three years. Then I got to Westminster, and um, I thought he was interesting and compelling. He's one of the few people who's actually doing theological, excuse me, to me, practical, philosophical thinking other than, than Van Til. But then on that score, he and Van Til are pretty similar. Um, and uh, uh, then my dad would send me Gary North's uh, world's going to end newsletter, but not because of the rapture, but but because of th this crisis or that crisis and how to invest. And so I read that probably for 15 years. And uh, just because North was a fascinating guy, it was just really interesting. But it's also where I got acquainted with conspiracy theory as, as just being a complete dead end. And even though North kind of felt like it too, he still couldn't resist it as near as I can tell. I got to know Gary personally uh, through Operation Rescue. He came out to support us. Um, actually, the, honestly, the first time I met him, we went up to his motel room um, and he was sitting up in bed. Um, <laughs> it was about nine o'clock and our, our events for the day were over and we weren't arrested. So we went up to see him. And uh, he was sitting up in bed, reading something and getting ready to go to bed. And so we all stood around his bed and, you know, sat on motel furniture and talked. And that's, it was just 
seeing that kind of big owl owl like guy. <laughs> it's like, huh, so that's that's Gary, that's the dreaded Gary North. <laughs> and um then then when I was in jail, um I basically read the most of three things. One was the Bible. I probably read through it about six or seven times, uh, just devoting a week to going straight through it. Uh, and then the other was um, everything Gary North had written up until that time I had smuggled into me by various people uh, and uh, or guards who were Christians. And then um, um, Stephen King, read a lot of Stephen King. Um, and it's it's where I came to the conclusion that actually, as a writer, Stephen King was stuck making the only world where horror works is in a mosaic theonomic world. Uh, <laughs> that's what, and so he himself, as a human being, is about as far out there as anybody can get. But the only way to make his literature work was to have a world. Um, and that might not be true of the gunslinger series, but is that just because there's, there's consequences for people's actions type of thing and they just come out exactly. in horrific ways? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, cl classic horror really only works in a Christian universe. Um, uh, because what, what the monster is, is, is it's the dehumanization of sin. Uh, what does he do? He eats you, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, a vampire. What better image of the of Satan or of evil people preying on the innocent, sucking out their blood, and so on? You know, it's, it's just it, all of them are are very much Christian stuff. And when they when the horror started getting away from it, it turns into slasher stuff. You know, the the lichens versus the vampires. Really, who cares? You know, you may as well talk about the Martians versus the Venusians. Uh, it's like they're not people, so whatever. <laughs> right? Yeah, that um, is an interesting thought. It's like that—that's one of the classic things about horror movie tropes is that the it's the monsters are a lot scarier when people created it, like yeah. Frankenstein or uh, vampire. It's like it it gets you for your sin, so it kills the. And that's all. One of the movie tropes is that whoever is the the monster reveals who has the right heart. Because that's the person that can overcome the monster. Yes, and and he also preys on the most you know the virginal, pure, uh, the child. He and and it's interesting how how in it, I don't know. This is this is Stephen King's probably not that edifying, but how in it, a band of kids, um, he plays very much on their innocence, and the evil can't really work with them real well you know, to get them scared and stuff like that. And in the end, it's because they love each other. And then he's left with, they all have sex with each other. And it's sort of like, he's built up this great story. It gets right up to that point, And then they realize they're going to have to do the ultimate love. So it's a, it's a bunch of kids having sex. And it's like, yeah, King, I mean, just messed up the whole story. It's like, <laughs> really? You had something good going there. Yeah. In their innocence, that's what they do. And, um, uh, you know, that's that's where I wish I could walk into his living room and just say, um, what what are you thinking? I, think, I'm, I'm, I mean, this is sort of the ultimate in pederastry. Yeah, I think um, he regrets writing that now. But obviously, they've cut that out of every film adaptation. Yes, I, 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 I always wait for them to, to do that. Then then when they're adults, it's it's kind of a different show because sex is a whole different thing with adults, adulterated or not. It's It's just it's a different. One of the things, well, anyway, I, I won't go into that. Just that's another another area that I challenge a lot of free people that are all around here. Um, is is when they say, "Well, do you have any problems with homosexuality?" I'll say, "Well, I don't know of a homosexual organization that's ever condemned um, uh, adults having children with um, with kids," and it just makes me wonder. Is there something fundamentally flawed here that that nobody's – isn't that kind of like the 50s? Well, I don't own any slaves or I don't oppress black people. Um, and, and, and and yet is, is, isn't there something terribly flawed in, in this whole thing? Right. Um, it's not just that you're not doing it, but you're not taking a stand against it either. Right. And, and so therefore, why is that? Well – 
actually, up until this whole new initiative, which is a whole different ball game, um, ninety percent, if not ninety nine percent, of the gay community came from uh, adults abusing minors. You know, I mean that that's like it or not, um, and 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 again, they 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 hate it. Most lesbians, you 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 go to their father. I mean, just just get them talking about how they became the person they're not even talking about uh, sex or anything. Just how did you become the person you are? The father is the spider, the vampire that bit them. Um, not necessarily had sex with them, but, but just abused them in whatever way it was, which could include sex. And then a string of men following that tradition. And then I've asked a number of the LGBT people who will come in and who, who will talk to me. Um, if, if they, um, uh, you know, aside from all of that, did you really run into a string of abusive men or were you set up to look for abuse as love? And, and then after a string of abusive men, they go whatever version of gender they, they move on to. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, just I wonder I if that that's some I wonder if that's some sort of connection with why the New Testament talks about the sin of Sodom being they they forgot the poor, where it's basically you have the poor being abused, you have the lowly being abused, and then that's what gives birth to uh, rampant homosexuality. Well, I would say it's of the same cloth at the very least, and. Uh, uh, and also, the hospitality is in there too. Mm -hmm. They neglect hospitality. It's sort of like <laughs> you think, <laughs> "Hey, send the men out so we can rape them." You think hospitality is their problem? <laughs> what was your first clue? <laughs> but um, seeing, it, to me, it's a similar thing to where you get the last mention of hell, and who's first on the list to go there? Oh, liars, cowards. Um, you know, all, all the things that we are, you know, right. why can't it be, you know, I'm not homosexual. Why not send them to hell first? Uh, you know, we always look for somebody else to get in line in front of us. <laughs> and, uh, anyway. Yeah. That's the whole, definitely the whole nature of man, which is why Christ's government is so radical. Cause it's. I'll take, and, and this gets back to the economic thing too. I'll take responsibility for something that's not even my problem. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll figure out how to refine oil so other people can get to work and I'll devote my life to, to solving that problem. And it's really, I mean, it doesn't affect, it doesn't affect me. Well, now that one's kind of spread throughout the economy so much where it would be your own problem too, pretty quickly if you didn't have gas or, or making food, you know, I'm going to, Somebody else is hungry. I'm going to make food for them. And somehow that's more profitable than making food for yourself. Yeah. It's just very counterintuitive. Well, it, it's almost like built into creation. That's why I say the cross is the foundation of creation. Because sacrificing for someone else to make their circumstances better. Um, sometimes you do it when you're remunerated. Sometimes you don't. But even when you're remunerated, that person is 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 a taking his monetized value that he's created through through his serving people, and and is serving you with the cash, uh, and and in so doing, you're redistributing uh, uh, the the natural resources of creation, and just because what I distribute is a good feeling, you know, coffee lattes. Uh, Fru fru stuff. Um, that's still a part of 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 um, rejuvenating that person, or well, maybe making them fat. But um, uh, the idea being being we're here to give you a place where where you can enter into as much as you can as an unbeliever the Sabbath rest. Well, how much of a Sabbath rest can an unbeliever enter into? Well, he can, he can rest. He can relax. Uh, he can appreciate his the the natural biocycles of his life, um, and that's kind of where God started introducing us to the concept of salvation 
was in the uh, was in the fourth commandment. And the reason there's a death penalty in the fourth commandment is because if you fail to enter into your rest when Christ comes, uh, you go to hell. There's the ultimate death penalty. And 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 so people say, well, that seems kind of harsh for not taking a day off. Again, it's a picture of well, not nearly as harsh as re rejecting so great a salvation. Um, there, there is no sacrifice for the one who neglects Christ. You can't go to the temple and have a bull and a goat sacrificed by the high priest of Israel. It doesn't do you any good anymore. Um, and it, it's it's that picture if we enter into the rest. So I see things like frou-frou jobs, like if somebody is a massage therapist or if somebody uh, does acupuncture, just pick a weird one, um, or runs a coffee shop or caters, those are all Sabbatarian uh, ministries. They're helping other people enter into their rest. Um, it's always got to be at the cost of somebody else's work, which, which is why it's called Christ's work becomes our rest. Yes, yes. I'll take column seven for what have we not mentioned yet? <laughs> Child rearing. Child rearing for 600, Alex. <laughs> um, I ended up being a co-pastor with three other very able, very knowledgeable men who were extremely patriarchal. And this is before it even occurred to me that patriarchy was an issue, it was a thing, was a way people thought. Uh, and, and so I came into it just thinking, well, okay, this is like an unusual shtick, but whatever. Um, well, I found out once the die was cast that um, women weren't permitted to speak in church. And one of the places where I got a, a, a distaste for a lot of patriarchs just watching how it worked out, stunting people's lives and the sort of rebellion that it did. And the thing is, these were really good men, really good families, everybody trying to make it work. Um, and uh, what it ended up doing was, was um, that's, in fact, if you hear Bojidar's stuff on uh, his anti-patriarchy stuff, a lot of his stories just, just come out of living with me in that community and in that church. <laughs> he was like, you have got to be kidding me. <laughs> because when I hear him talk about it now, just just I can hear just down through the years. <laughs> that's 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 where he first, uh, you know, when he tells the, the story of of um, the guy who, who's me in an elders meeting, and the elders are talking about the uh, three, uh, the three. Or I feel like Joe Joe Biden here. <laughs> oh, it's a three letter word. <laughs> Jobs is a three letter word. <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, three uh, uh, spheres of authority being uh, the the family, church, and state. I said, no, there's four. There's the individual. Well, it's not a government. Yes, it is. We have a spirit of love. Uh, what was it? Love something and self control, self government. So this was a one hour thing. That's one of Bojar's favorite stories of how they don't even get that if you're not self governed, no other government works. Uh, the wife who's not self-governed is going to be running around with other men. The man who's not self-governed is going to be running around with other women or his children or who knows what. Uh, so self-government has to be the foundational government on which the others are built. Um, before you even get to any of my other anti-government arguments. But, um, so, but I, I see raising children First of all, I see the heavy reliance on the rod as being the presupposition that the child is a fool. And I don't think that's a healthy presupposition. And I don't think it's the way Jesus looked at him. Now, is folly bound up in the heart of a child? Yeah, a lot of things are. Um, but if, if you go to the rod as your major means of driving the folly far from him, first of all, nowhere in the Bible to say it's the only way to drive the folly from him. It just says it'll work. Um, but if you find yourself physically punishing your kids enough, a question you ought to be asking yourself is, I wonder why it ain't, why it isn't working. 
what's happening here? Doesn't it always have to be be. with an eye towards you use it to the end to where you can stop using it because they have internalized it? Yes. Now, what happens if we see our walk with our children as, as enabling them to enter into the rest they were born in as covenant children? Now, at this point, if you're a Baptist, I'm not sure where you go with that. Okay, so there may just be some built-in hostility here. Um, but but at every point, when people ask if I'm a Credo Baptist or a Pedo Baptist, I say, no, I'm a Commando Baptist. You <laughs> baptize the people Jesus commanded you to. And so when Jesus gets, if he's getting up, upset that they're getting rid of the kids, he says, let them come to me. Well, anyway, that's a, that's the command. But, but aside from all that, what we're doing with our children is we're entering into the rest of Jesus Christ. And so the timeout chair, or whatever that is, shouldn't be the place that they are sent to be going to exile, but rather should be the place where we join them outside the camp and, and continue to fellowship with them as our, as, as our children. And the major thing that bonds us to them, this goes back to the first commandment. Before you get to any of the other stuff, the other, all the other commandments aren't going to make much sense if you're not walking with God, if he's not your only God, if you're not exclusively, he's the one. And so as we raise our children, the first commandment to me to be applied to that situation is we walk with them. And you find indeed, that's what Moses says, when you lie down, when you get up, when you go out, when you come in. This is literally everything in life. And that's we began with me giving an example to my unbelieving staff, how I, how I explained to them the full gospel of, of God's transformation of the earth and invite them to be a part of it. Um, and uh, uh, that's, that's the same thing with our children uh, in, in every respect, uh, showing them how being that person with them then when the time comes first of all you might not have to spank them you might have to spank them to me that's irrelevant the point is it'll drive it'll drive the folly out of them it'll draw you closer as opposed to driving them away and 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 provoking your children and and how do you keep from provoking your children but it's not that you spank them light or spank them hard or put them in a quarter instead of spanking or give them whatever they want. It's that you've been walking with them. So your word, to me, this is just what it means to be a prophet. Your word doesn't fall to the ground with them. And the reason it doesn't is because you've walked with them. Uh, and and so that's, that's uh, you've taken up your cross. Helping them go in the right direction, whether that means attracting them to something that's good or steering them away from something that's bad or any right. combination. And, and the more, su- well, at that point, my mother would say comparisons are odious. I won't say the more. Um, it's, it's, it starts with the doctrine of creation. They're in God's image. They're in your covenant family. If you're a Baptist, you'll give them one kind of status. If you're a Presbyterian, you'll give them another kind of status, but they're in your covenant family. They're with you, uh, and and God created them as created things in creation. He made them good. I'm not talking about original sin. Sin is what you do with what you, what's good. But he's made them creatures in his image, and that's a good thing. Uh, then we go to Christ. What does Christ do with all these creatures in his image who are, in that respect, good? Uh, what does he do? He dies for them. He walks with them. He teaches them, he disciples them, and he dies for them. Uh, but first of all, he becomes one of them. Let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. And that should be our mind with our children. Uh, that, that we aren't just out here, the authoritarian parent. We are with them. I am with you, a servant. Uh, and and it also, again, we got to get away from the idea that, that the master and the servant is, is defined by uh, who, who sets policy. Yeah, I mean, the parent's going to set policy. How do you bring people along? Well, you get them to share in that vision uh, for the joy that was set before him. He despised the cross. And you get to see, you get them seeing that. Then, then uh, uh, you, you, uh, you suffer for them. You suffer with them. Uh, 
and you can go through each one of the cardinal doctrines and see how the presence of God in our life uh, becomes a pattern for the child to learn how to walk with the Lord. I think one of the entirely unexpected cultural things, which I am really happy about, a feminism, which I didn't think anything good could come of it. The women, by saying, <laughs> my wife just, just sent me a, a text that says, your dinner is ready, heart. Well, see, the beautiful thing is my wife cooks for me because she loves to cook and take care of people. So, so anyway, my mother absolutely hated it. She was the first mayor of the town I grew up in. Um, but the, 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 uh, what they did when they basically said, uh, I'm not going to be stuck in the house, all that rebellious stuff, it caused men, we, we, the, the snowflake generation has more men spending more time with their children than any other group of men in history at a younger <laughs> formative age. And I, I'm just thinking, wow, you know, just the wicked are not going to win. They can't. Because if they do anything that results in anything that's positive, uh, they're blessed. They can't help but be blessed. And it, it's like, I can't tell you how many um, couples, when they start, really trying to both of them take care of the kid and hold jobs and do all the stuff it takes. They're all of a sudden all about the gospel because that's what you got to do to raise a kid. And, 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 and just sharing the theology with them that starts shining on their life. Um, anyway, so I got to say there, there's nothing the wicked can do that God can't overcome. Yeah, it's a the busted clock is right twice a day, and yeah. people also learn from their mistakes. So, at least twice a day, people are learning something good that they should do again and carry forward. I saw that with the uh, the pandemic, with all the people started homeschooling, and then yes. in the relationship that they built with their kids, they're like, you know what? I think this actually works better for us. We're gonna keep doing yeah, it this, this way. Is, this is a good thing. And it was yeah. completely by accident. It was because they were literally forced to. And then they actually like, huh, for some people that's stuck. And I can't be happier. <laughs> if a pandemic's going to do something, uh, if anything can, good can come out of the pandemic, I'll take homeschooling for sure. Yeah. Do you have random people that you don't know add you on Facebook? Is that a good way? Are your posts public? I All my posts are totally public. Anybody can look at them who wants to and well I'll, I'll tell you why i like facebook one is i i can talk to people and i can really practice uh especially with trolls i I'm a, i find a troll has a ministry of seeing if i can't think he'll ask me the same question or she'll say the same thing so many different times it's almost like groundhog's day i could go oh, i'll try it this way yep. They come back to the same old, same old. I'll try it that way. And just do it without ever losing patience, without ever cursing and with just being friendly. Um, and then there are a couple of trolls I'm not so friendly with. But uh, even there, I, I usually say, so we agree. That, that almost always gets a troll. <laughs> <laughs> I don't agree with you. Well, what are you so crabby about? I'm trying to agree with you. Right. <laughs> That was something that I learned from my dad as a kid, and he taught me that online. We used to sit around. He would print out Facebook back and forth discussions he had had with a disagreement with somebody, and we would sit and we would look at his responses of family and notice certain patterns with certain people. Uh, our favorite term we invented is is called uh, some some people like to do what we call an elephant dump, where mm -hmm. you make a point that's actually really good or you ask a really good question and they don't agree with you and they don't want to engage. So they post 80 paragraph long comment full of just everything. And they hope by just giving you a, a long enough response that you won't actually read it. And they shut you up that way. Well, I, I'm afraid that that brings to the second reason why I like Facebook. It forces me to be brief mm -hmm. because as I've written in a lot of other contexts, because I can do as much as I want to, I end up, as you've noticed in this conversation, scarcely being able to stay on topic, but somehow it all fits together. 
maybe, um, if you want to take the time to figure it out. Uh, and what I like about Facebook is I can do a number, practice a number of different things. Like I'll have days, if you followed me at all, you, you've seen it, where it's all memes. It's just, and, and a lot of times the memes will be on the same topic. It's just, I'm trying to say it this way, that way, the other way. It's a fun place to practice. And then when you actually print out the elephant dump, it's only about three quarters of a page, right. maybe a page. Right. It's just and the tolerance for a long comment on Facebook is very Exactly. Short. And so it forces, it, it, I shouldn't say it forces, it pushes towards brevity. But then then when you get brief, I mean, a lot of people make, make things that to me strike me as really provocative. Oh, that's good. Say more about it. And they're kind of at a loss. It's like, well, I just said everything I can think about. <laughs> well, did you mean this? Did you mean that? And then they start thinking I'm a troll. It's like, no, it was just an interesting thought. I mean, develop it with me. Right. And um, people uh, don't know how to take agreeableness on Facebook sometimes. <laughs> that's 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 really true. But there's only a very small handful of people that will be disagreeable with, uh, and and usually, I shouldn't say usually. There's a two in particular. It's not at all that I don't like them. In in the case of one guy, literally, I spent two or three months trying to trying to agree with them, trying to state what he said and say that's good. And every time he would say, "No, I missed it completely." It's almost as if he said, "Quit disagreeing with me. This is the way it really is." And so I finally came to the conclusion he can't be agreed with. Um, so he has a different problem. So I'll just. Every time he posts, I'll address a central problem, which is, in his view, the entire world is wicked and sinful. There's nothing good about it. And all the information we have is completely distorted. And so the question is, so how do you know you're right? What verification is possible in that world? This is, this is God's world. Uh, therefore, the wicked cannot help in giving it. And I would give, when they give us information give us a way to evaluate it because it's God's world. We have God's world. And that's why when you're watching, you know, we're all stuck in our houses and we're glued to the TV set to see what Trump is going to say next and what all, if everything is going to happen. And, and all of a sudden they tell us that, that, uh, you know, completely just news that uh, Cuomo has just put all these AIDS people in the AIDS. <laughs> this takes me back to the, I was running a janitorial service when AIDS hit HIV. <laughs> That's not the job you want to be into in the world. In the world of is this toilet infected? Fluids. <laughs> that's 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 not where the line on the kingdom of God in the bottom of the toilet bowl came from. I would hire kids in youth groups, but um, the only Jesus that the people they all know you're Christian. The only way they're going to know anything about Jesus is whether he can clean an ashtray. Um, so what kind of Jesus are you going to show them? Anyway, the the um, it's when I got out of Westminster, I really I'd been in books for like 24 years. I wanted to see if any of it worked. <laughs> so I started a janitorial service for the next five years, uh, which absolutely mortified um, almost all my Westminster con connections. <laughs> how can you how can you how can you get the best education in the world and go do that? Jesus, said, how, well, how can you possibly wash people's feet? That's servant stuff. Exactly. How can it be the best education in the world if you can't? Um, so, uh, but but um, that completely drove out of my mind everything else going on and on about. Oh, oh, the world is, it, and so you go back to Genesis one, and the world is God's world, and everything in it is good. It's what we do with the things that's, that's righteous or unrighteous, and what we do with things starts with the persons whose words we eat and drink. And, and that is Adam's and Eve's relationship with God. That's where everything begins. Uh, and that's why the first commandment's the first commandment. It begins with a personal relationship. I am the Lord, your God. He didn't go to the king of Israel and he didn't go, he didn't even go to Moses, except Moses happened to be there as, as somebody who conveyed it. But, but the law is conveyed to each individual is Israelite, man, woman, and child. You are to know these things. You are to walk in these things. These are to restructure you from the, from the bottom of your heart. The purpose of the law is not to be forced from the top, but it's to be lived out of the fullness 
of the heart so the mouth can speak righteousness, fresh water, not salty water. Um, and that's the that's from the very giving of the law. It was always given that way. And and it's to apply to everything as you lie down, stand up, etc. Um, and so if just just by doing that, um, I never got it. A scholar's mind is this, and someday you'll get married, poor girl, and you will have children, poor children. Um, but but this is what a scholar does. A scholar can remember just a ridiculous amount of stuff and then pull it out of his memory and put it together in a coherent thought and apply it to something. That's what scholars do. And they have one more thing. If they're really good scholars, they can footnote it. Uh, and so all my kids are good scholars. None of them pursued scholarship. I'm a good, I'm, I'm a natural scholar. I pursued it up until I should have taken a church for about 10 years and then gotten a PhD in something and then gone and taught somewhere. I had the mind for it. I'm creative. I can I can argue with anybody and that, that kind of thing. And instead of doing that, I started janitorial service. From there, got involved with uh, uh, just pro-life activism. We got abortion out of the two hospitals in Norristown. Uh, my wife and I did that, leading the group. Then, then from there, went to the first leadership, national leadership meeting with Operation Rescue. Uh, from there, got about 55,000 people arrested over the next 10-year period. Probably led uh, about 28 or 30,000 of them myself with a bunch of other people. I mean, I was, I was part of a much larger group. Um, and then from there, I became unemployable, by and large. Went back to trying to be a pastor. Um, and uh, went, went from there and... Anyway, so I taught at a at a at a college for about five years, uh, and then decided that that what I would do. But the end result of all this is, with with the head of a of a philosopher and a scholar, all I've ever done is things with my hands, and done stuff. So it turns everything into a very practical thing. So when whenever somebody crosses my path, I'm constantly tying everything to the gospel and the word of God. Why? Well, that's just a gift God gave me. That's what scholars do. And, and I would die if I had to actually do what book scholars do. That would kill me. I had a shot at that about, about 30 years ago. Now I, I would fall fast asleep. I, I, I would have a very hard time reading any kind of a book. Um, it's just incredibly boring to me because, because it's like what you said back in the beginning about couldn't we do something better with this half hour listening to the pastor? You know, couldn't something, but I mean, if nothing else, couldn't we have at least had a beer? Um, and, and uh, to be uh, uh, turned loose to where I, I can't write a book. Actually, I did write a book, but that's another long story. I have another book. I can't get it published. I literally have no idea how to do it. I've tried several times. I hate to admit this, I I tried to set up a blog because it seemed like I mean I'd, I'd be a perfect blogger. Shouldn't I be blogging? Why not? Well, I can't do it. I finally paid money for people to set up blogs for me. It didn't work. And then I had a, a manager with with my um, catering business, my wife's catering business, who set me up on on uh, Facebook. Showed me how to do it. Later, died of a heroin overdose. Um, but he got me onto Facebook. Uh, and these are just, so, so as I see it, you were asking about theonomy. What happened with theonomy is the first generation were the really bright uh, Rush Dooney, North, and Bonson. Yeah, you know, just, they have untouchable brains. They're really good. They had a great vision. They worked it out. They're brilliant people. Um, but there wasn't a school that would touch them. And when one of them got touched, he was out on the street. And like I say, I really, in, in the early days, I thought it was his fault. Now I don't. It just just because of who you are, people will pick a fight with you. If you answer, it means you're belligerent. Um, then uh, uh, the next generation wasn't going to get a, any of the major schools on their side. So they all went into the pastoral ministry. 
And with the exception of about one or two of them, the churches were teeny tiny because nobody wants to come to that kind of stuff. You know, and I'm not saying it's not the law of God they're coming to. It's it's a presentation that Jesus is already deep sixed. And then at the end of all that, um, the Gen 3 are truck drivers and people like you. I'm, I don't know if you're a theonomist or not, but but I mean, you know, they're, they're people who are out in the world just doing it. And they're applying God's law. And, and, and uh, the ones that get radical are the abolitionists. Um, and not all of them are theonomists, obviously, but, but, you know, they really like that kind of stuff. <laughs> it's offensive. <laughs> it's, uh, so, um, that's just kind of the, um, that's just been the track. And the only thing, well, I really did enjoy Operation Rescue. I would love to be a professor. Uh, some of the best years of my life were being able just to have a job of trying to figure out how to talk to a room full of kids so that they would really get what I was talking about in a disciplined way through a whole discipline. It's that same thing, what you've been mentioning, like people get kicked out of, you try to get a job as a professor and you get kicked out or you go to a church, you start up a, a church, try to be a pastor and your, your congregation is just this teeny tiny little thing. And I actually kind of think that was Jesus's pattern. I mean, he could have taken on hundreds of disciples. He's God in the flesh, right? If he, if anybody could do it, he can. Yeah. And yeah. he he gives everybody a hard message. He gathers his big crowd first to where he had lots of disciples. And then he gives them a hard saying to call the herd so he only has 12 people to deal with. And he tells them all the, mm -hmm. the secret things and really pours into them diligently for three years. I think that should probably be our pattern. Maybe not be hard-nosed about it, but there's something – I don't want to just dismiss that as – I want to go out and I want to completely change 12 people's lives from the bottom up as radically as possible rather than 50,000 people read my book, but they've never spent a day with me. Yeah. And I would much rather, I think just based on the way that my dad discipled us go the, go the small and deep route rather than the wide or broad and shallow 